technologies that lower greenhouse gas emissions. From mountain to seashore, from small island communities to the largest cities. In the ocean we want, our ocean protects us and makes us resilient to climate change. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number six, increase community resilience to ocean hazards. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? Rising sea levels, harmful algae blooms, and more frequent destructive storms are putting the lives and livelihoods of coastal communities around the world in jeopardy. As threats increase, experts and authorities must have the knowledge to issue warnings and communities must have the skills and information to respond effectively. The Ocean Decade will foster investment in more effective forecast and early warning systems so we can reduce risks and save lives on land and at sea. From global early warning systems to coastal cities and communities ready to face tsunamis, storm surges and rising sea levels, to coastal and marine ecosystems that are protected and can offer nature-based solutions to protect communities and infrastructure. Let's harness ocean knowledge to empower individuals and prepare communities so they are ready to face natural ocean hazards. In the ocean we want, people and communities are safe and resilient because we can reduce and respond to the hazards of a dynamic ocean. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number seven. Expand the global ocean observing system. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? We're all connected through one shared ocean, from the coast to the high seas, from the ocean surface to its depths. Sharing information and technology keeps us safe, our economies productive, and our ocean healthy. Through ocean observing systems, scientists, experts, and governments share observations for climate, operational services, and marine ecosystem health. But the current system has gaps and lacks institutional and financial support. Let's seize the ocean decade as a chance to amplify this system's impact, making it sustainable and capable of delivering critical information to those who need it. Together we can expand the knowledge of our past, current and future ocean, leaving no country behind. A truly inclusive and integrated observing system can predict climate, forecast weather, monitor and manage ocean health, and offer real-time services for sustainable development. In the ocean we want, our global ocean observing system tells us about the state of our ocean, so we can respond to changing conditions wherever we are. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number eight. Create a digital representation of the ocean. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? First, we must fully explore today's ocean. It's countless challenges and endless possibilities. Sometimes this means understanding the past and sometimes this means projecting the future. Today, we know more about the moon than we do the ocean but we have a unique opportunity to change this. 
working with some of the best minds in ocean science, the Ocean Decade fosters partnerships to explore and fully map the ocean, creating a digital atlas of our planet's crown jewel, from surface to depths, from biodiversity to cultural and social values, from shorelines to open spaces. This knowledge will support dynamic and sustainable ocean management in a constantly changing ocean. Let's find new ways to see our past, current and future ocean through open data and freely shared information. Together, let's create an accessible ocean for present and future generations. In the ocean we want, we know everything about the ocean so that we may better protect and sustainably manage our planet's blue wealth. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge 9 Deliver skills, knowledge and technology to all. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? The answer is we don't. Unless we have the necessary skills, knowledge and technology readily available to every expert and citizen alike. If we are to reverse our planetary crisis together, everyone needs access to ocean information and the skills to turn that knowledge into sustainable solutions and action. Whether you work in science, government, business, civil society, or are a citizen committed to protecting the ocean, you can play a part in this open ocean knowledge revolution. The Ocean Decade encourages the exchange and sharing of skills, knowledge, and technology to cultivate health responses that can collectively promote a clean, safe and accessible ocean for present and future generations. Let's use the Ocean Decade to build bridges between disciplines and across geographical and generational divides to radically open access to data, technology and skills and achieve together the ocean we want by 2030. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number 10. Change humanity's relationship with the ocean. How do we go from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? Let's start with a bit of imagination. Imagine an ocean that we no longer take for granted. An ocean that we respect for regulating our climate and inspiring hundreds of cultures around the world. Imagine the power of a whole generation of all ages and walks of life committed to saving our planet's largest ecosystem. Ocean knowledge gives us a clear picture of the worsening human impacts on the ocean. Education and ocean literacy give us the keys to changing our behavior so that we can protect the ocean. Time for change is running out, but the next 10 years of ocean action will be critical for a step change in our relation with the ocean. The Ocean Decade is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for humanity to reconnect with the ocean, understand its importance to our survival, and use that knowledge to transform our relationship. In the ocean we want, we live respectfully with our shared ocean, carefully and sustainably managing its precious resources. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number one. Understand and beat marine pollution. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? Today, we see plastic waste everywhere, from the ocean depths to the remotest islands of the Pacific. Yet the ocean is also menaced by pollution we cannot see. 
untreated sewage, pesticides and fertilizers, toxic chemicals, heavy metals and other harmful substances. They're not just a threat to marine life, but also to human health and livelihoods. The Ocean Decade is an opportunity to identify, map and reduce these sources of pollution. Working hand in hand, scientists, businesses, governments and many other groups can create and roll out solutions that eliminate pollution at the source, reduce its impacts and deliver a clean ocean for us all. And as consumers, we all have an important role to play. Ocean Decade Challenge number one, understand and beat marine pollution. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? Today, we see plastic waste everywhere, from the ocean depths to the remotest islands of the Pacific. Yet the ocean is also menaced by pollution we cannot see. Untreated sewage, pesticides and fertilizers, toxic chemicals, heavy metals and other harmful substances. They're not just a threat to marine life, but also to human health and livelihoods. The Ocean Decade is an opportunity to identify, map and reduce these sources of pollution. Working hand in hand, scientists, businesses, governments and many other groups can create and roll out solutions that eliminate pollution at the source, reduce its impacts and deliver a clean ocean for us all. And as consumers, we all have an important role to play over the next 10 years to beat marine pollution. In the ocean we want, we embrace habits of buying and consuming that help keep our ocean clean and healthy. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today! Ocean Decade Challenge number two, protect and restore ecosystems and biodiversity. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? Until recently, marine ecosystems were largely untouched and teeming with rich biodiversity. Yet something has changed over the last 50 years. Coral reefs, top ocean predators, and some of our last pristine marine ecosystems are vanishing. How much more damage must occur before we take action? Healthy marine ecosystems protect our coastlines from storms and erosion, providing safe habitats for millions of species key to nature's equilibrium, offering food security to billions of people and shielding against climate change. The Ocean Decade fosters an understanding of the challenges facing our ocean so we can live in harmony with nature. Networks of marine protected areas combined with nature-based solutions can sustain our needs and livelihoods while rebuilding a mindful, sustainable and equitable relationship with our shared ocean. Acting as one global community, we can harness knowledge to build tools that protect, restore and manage marine and coastal ecosystems. In the ocean we want, marine ecosystems are cherished and understood, keeping our ocean healthy and resilient. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number three, sustainably feed the global population. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want. The ocean has nourished us for thousands of years, fueling and strengthening our communities while underpinning human health and development. Yet growing populations, along with greater awareness of the harmful impacts of land-based meat sources, have driven the demand for ocean-based alternatives. This has led to bigger and unsustainable fishing, trawling and dredging the ocean floor disturbances in the ocean food web and disappearing fish species. Is there time to restore ocean seafood resources? 
Yes, the Ocean Decade allows scientists, governments and industry to explore and implement innovative solutions that reduce pressure on marine ecosystems by restoring and managing fish stocks, improving aquaculture and harvesting sustainable seafood. Consuming sustainable seafood is an easy way to join the Ocean Decade. Together, we can support communities relying on seafood resources for their livelihoods while multiplying the seafood the ocean supplies. In the ocean we want, we protect crucial ocean habitats and harvest seafood mindfully so we can always rely on the ocean to feed the global population. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number four. Develop a sustainable and equitable ocean economy. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? The ocean provides livelihoods and nourishment for hundreds of millions of the world's poorest people. The global economy depends on the ocean through fisheries, energy, tourism, and transport. The way we manage and share the ocean's limited resources has a global impact on coastal communities, indigenous peoples, and marine ecosystems. Let's seize the ocean decade to unlock transformative ocean science solutions that connect people with the ocean in a productive cycle. Investing in ocean science and technological innovations will create employment opportunities around the world and multiply sixfold the amount of seafood available. A clean, healthy ocean also impacts tomorrow's renewable energy sources, minerals, and medical breakthroughs. Over the next 10 years, Blue Knowledge will give us the tools to use and manage our marine resources for a healthy and productive ocean, for the well being of humankind and the planet. In the ocean we want, both society and planet benefit from an equitable and sustainable ocean economy, so no one is left behind. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number five. Unlock ocean-based solutions to climate change. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? The ocean is our greatest ally against climate change. It absorbs heat and carbon in the atmosphere. Mangroves and coral reefs protect communities against climate change effects. Ocean-based energy reduces harmful greenhouse gas emissions. But our ocean is unhealthy, with rising temperatures and sea levels, acidic waters, shrinking glaciers, disappearing ecosystems and species, intense weather events, and fish populations shifting toward cooler waters. This leaves our planet and humanity at great risk. Time is ticking. Life and livelihoods in many small island states are already suffering. Ocean science helps us understand ocean climate interactions with data and knowledge to predict and respond to changes. Together, let's harness the ocean decade for ocean-based solutions to help mitigate, adapt, and build resilience to climate change, like making smarter investments in technologies that lower greenhouse gas emissions. From mountain to seashore, from small island communities to the largest cities, in the ocean we want, our ocean protects us and makes us resilient to climate change. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today.
Ocean Decade Challenge number six, increase community resilience to ocean hazards. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? Rising sea levels, harmful algae blooms, and more frequent destructive storms are putting the lives and livelihoods of coastal communities around the world in jeopardy. As threats increase, experts and authorities must have the knowledge to issue warnings, and communities must have the skills and information to respond effectively. The Ocean Decade will foster investment in more effective forecast and early warning systems so we can reduce risks and save lives on land and at sea. From global early warning systems to coastal cities and communities ready to face tsunamis, storm surges and rising sea levels, to coastal and marine ecosystems that are protected and can offer nature-based solutions to protect communities and infrastructure. Let's harness ocean knowledge to empower individuals and prepare communities so they are ready to face natural ocean hazards. In the ocean we want, people and communities are safe and resilient because we can reduce and respond to the hazards of a dynamic ocean. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Hello and welcome to our sixth Ocean Decade Laboratory, an accessible ocean. And like the previous laboratories, it's hosted by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research in partnership with the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, in short, IOC UNESCO. And I'm Monica Jones. I'm very happy to be back to guide you through the program of this core event today and also the wrap up on Thursday. Having said that, the wrap up is going to be a little bit more than just a wrap-up. It is actually this time a kind of extension or culmination of the discussions we're going to lead today. 
And for everyone who's joining us for the first time, as you all know, the United Nations General Assembly proclaimed 2021 to 2030 as the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, that is, in short, the Ocean Decade. And the aim is to bring together scientists and stakeholders to help restore our planet's largest ecosystem, namely the ocean, and prepare the path for sustainable development. Now, the first uh, international and uh, big Ocean Decade conference was uh, kicked off last year, and it is now being followed by seven Ocean Decade laboratories, each focusing on one very specific Ocean Decade outcome today, an accessible ocean. But before we get down to business, uh, as always, because this is a virtual conference still, uh, so it's, uh, it makes sense to take a closer look at our online platform, our conference platform, so you know how it all works and can engage accordingly. Now, firstly, you need to be in the live stream, and I suppose you are, else you wouldn't see and hear me. Now, you can choose the language in which you want to follow our event, that's English, French or Spanish, or English with subtitles. When you take a look at the right-hand side, you see the white chat box. Here you can engage in our panel discussions by submitting your comments and questions, and please do so. We would like to hear from you. Now, if you scroll just below the live stream, you can see the agenda uh, with today's event, the core event, satellite activities, and Thursday's wrap-up. Uh, during the core event and Thursday's wrap-up, you can also get in touch uh, with our team via the live help desk, uh, just in case you run into technical or any other problems. And when we turn our attention to the left-hand side now, we see several buttons, including the lounge. Here you can review all the laboratories that already took place. If you want to know more about uh, today's speakers, then go to the speakers corner, exactly where you can find their biographies. And right below you find the satellite activities. There are 22 in total taking place today, tomorrow and on Thursday, all over the globe and in different time zones. Last but not least, I would like to mention the Ocean Library, because here you can find tons of materials, photos, documents, videos, which you can all download and share as long as you credit the author. And you also find the FAQ section, uh, the most frequently asked questions and answers, of course. Now, if you use Twitter, uh, that would be great, of course. We always appreciate that, uh, even more so when you use the hashtag Ocean Decade. And in case you're not watching us on the conference platform, but uh, on YouTube, then that's great. Hello, welcome, good to have you with us. Uh, there's just one downside. On YouTube, you cannot engage with us. So all the functions I just mentioned, you will not have access to. You can change that because you can still register on our website, and that is oceandecade-conference.com. Com. And be sure, if you have access to the conference platform, to engage, to use the chat, and to submit your questions. So let's uh, start this Ocean Decade Laboratory officially with the welcome remarks from our co-hosts. And we're starting with Jens Schiffers. He's scientific officer at the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Bonn. And he joins us now. Uh, Jens Schiffers, very good to have you with us. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, Mr. Rayabin, Professor Hornich, Mr. Unger, ladies and gentlemen, um, at this Ocean Decade Laboratory, we want to discuss and explore an accessible ocean with you. That is an ocean with good governance, open access to data, information, and technologies. Just over 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Most of this comprises the ocean, which in many respects is largely unexplored. However, our knowledge about the ocean is growing rapidly and we want to increase it even faster during the remaining nine years of the ocean decade. New technologies are being used to gather data in and about the ocean. This data is analyzed quickly, including with the use of artificial intelligence in future and feeds into ever improving modeling approaches that provide us with a clearer picture of the ocean. We are still far from achieving our goal, but the ocean knowledge base will continue to improve in the coming years. So it is all the more important to make this data easily accessible and available to everyone. Research frequently builds on existing knowledge. It is a major task to make this knowledge available to all the ocean stakeholders so that the ocean and everyone who depends on it for their livelihood can benefit to the fullest possible extent. 
We must face up to these challenges if we want to achieve the goal of the 2030 Agenda of, for Sustainable Development and other international agreements for the protection and sustainable use of the oceans. This requires extensive transformation processes, which is why we are dedicating today's Ocean Decade Laboratory to the topic of an accessible ocean. What kind of knowledge is needed to support key ocean governance processes? What does science offer in support of the sustainability transformations? What kind of science architecture is required to deliver relevant science to policy? We are asking ourselves these questions today in order to make ocean data more accessible, understandable and easier to use, thus to facilitate the translation of knowledge about the ocean into policy action. It's my great pleasure to open another Ocean Decade Laboratory in partnership with the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. It's our shared aim to encourage discussion and exchange to promote international cooperation that transcends all the boundaries of different subject disciplines and different groups of stakeholders. We need lasting partnerships both within ocean science and beyond. I would like to thank everyone actively involved in the shaping the UN, ocean, the UN Decade of Ocean Sciences for Sustainable Development with the six laboratory, namely the scientists and researchers and all the experts and actors uh, from government and civil society, as well as our viewers around the world. Let us work together to create the ocean we want. I look forward to stimulating virtual discussions about the ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jens Schiffer uh, from the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, or BMBF, as we say here in Germany. And Jens Schiffer has already mentioned the importance of uh, the Ocean Decade's uh, partnership with IOC UNESCO. So we're absolutely delighted now to also hear the welcome message from the IOC's Executive Secretary, Vladimir Ryabinin. Uh, the floor is yours. Dear Monica, thank you for uh, uh, obviously, as always, giving me the floor at the beginning of a uh, uh, laboratory and uh, for, for your illuminating uh, con conduct of, of those events. Thank you, our dear colleagues from the Federal uh, Ministry of Education Research, BNBF, uh, for being our faithful partner in this marathon already. So this is the sixth laboratory uh, that is called Accessible Ocean. You know, uh, we have been uh, in the process of designing now implementing the decade already for uh, for five years and uh, uh, the ideas uh, that we need to create uh, certain qualities of the ocean and also qualities of people in relation to the ocean started with the notion of transparent ocean but in the process of the uh, uh, design of the decade the idea changed uh, uh, and now we call it accessible ocean uh, access uh, this in the sense means uh, access uh, to governance, better governance, access to data, information and technology. And uh, definitely this is a principle of uh, accessible ocean that makes the, all of our activities in decade fair fair and honest. So this is one of the most important principles uh, because, you know, it makes what we do, what we design and what we implement honest and ethical. So uh, I would like to say that let's discuss this from this standpoint. And uh, uh, what we are trying to achieve in the end is that we uh, change uh, the ocean, we change the people in their relation with the ocean, we make people more honest, and also uh, access to data and having data transparent makes decisions transparent and verifiable. That increases responsibility for what we do in the ocean and what we do with, with the people. So uh, in that sense, uh, uh, the accessible ocean for us is a very important verification point for everything that we're going to achieve in the decade. And uh, at the start of the decade, discussing the data, which is central for, for ocean science, for managing the ocean, once I was asked how you would see the success of the decade in relation to data. And my response was, and still is, that I hope that in the result of the decade, we will create a new situation in which will be more advantageous for states, stakeholders, people, scientists, uh, private sector to 
open the data, to exchange the data, and on the basis of that exchange, generate products. And if it is more advantageous to open the data and generate useful products for managing the ocean, then uh, to sit on the data, or close data close to your chest, that will be the success of the decade. And I hope very much that this laboratory, Accessible Ocean Laboratory, will be contributing to that paradigm, to that understanding, and will set us on the path to more accessible ocean and to our better human relations with the ocean and better people as well. Thank you so much and good luck for the three days of the laboratory. Thank you so much, Vladimir Rabinin, uh, the IOC's uh, executive secretary. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, when it comes to data, uh, data sharing and knowledge sharing, knowledge gathering, all of these are uh, topics that we will explore in the course of the next uh, three days. Thank you so much for expressing the expectations you have in this laboratory. Uh, and Vladimir Rabinin also mentioned uh, the word a marathon. Of course, he was referring to the entire ocean decade, but even the ocean decade laboratories resemble a kind of marathon. This is the sixth already. Uh, the last five ones focused on an engaging and inspiring ocean, a predicted ocean, a clean ocean, a healthy and resilient ocean, and the last one, the fifth one, a safe ocean. So now it's time to focus on an accessible ocean. But what exactly that means and what's in store for you now, we've prepared a little video in order to give you an idea what to expect of this laboratory. Let's have a look. The ocean is vital for our planet and for us. It provides food, regulates the climate, is home to uncounted species, offers recreational opportunities and inspiration, and is essential to the way of life of indigenous communities. Without the ocean, we are nothing, which raises questions such as, what can we do to protect the ocean? How can we use it sustainably? How do we govern the ocean and who gets to decide how we manage its vast riches? Did you know that nearly two-thirds of the ocean is in areas beyond national jurisdiction where no single state has authority? These areas are home to unique species and ecosystems, but a global agreement to ensure their conservation and sustainable use is lacking. How can a new global agreement close this gap in political responsibility? One key challenge will be the translation of knowledge into action by the science community and through sharing our scientific findings in a way that is engaging, accessible and understandable for everybody. In order to keep the ocean accessible, we need to make sure that our knowledge about it is both inclusive and approachable. The UN Ocean Decade Laboratory on the outcome of an accessible ocean therefore focuses on how knowledge, data and expertise are currently shared and how science policy society interfaces can be improved so that ocean governance processes and policies at the local, national, regional and global level can all benefit from an improved understanding of the ocean. The sixth laboratory will address these questions across three panel discussions with guests from NGOs, the policy sphere and academia who will share their perspectives on what the future architecture of ocean science and interfaces between science, society and policy should look like. Welcome to the Ocean Decade Laboratory on the topic of an accessible ocean. Now, in this context, how about this for a statement? Sustainable ocean governance needs knowledge that is thorough, inclusive and comprehensible. I'm pretty sure that we all agree to that one. Sadly, uh, it wasn't my statement. It is actually a quote by one of our laboratory chairs. I'm going to introduce them to you uh, uh, shortly. Uh, but that was a statement made on the lab's social media site, where you can also find it by, as you can see, Anna Katharina Hornich. Uh, and uh, this is what we call an engagement post. And uh, apart from uh, reading and discussing and thinking about this particular quote, uh, you're more than welcome 
to submit your own ideas and your own visions in order to have more engagement posts on this social media site. And now that we already know uh, who is responsible for this engagement post, uh, let me introduce you to the chairs of this Sixth Ocean Decade Laboratory. Namely, here in the studio with me in Berlin, Professor Dr. Anna Katharina Hornig. Uh, she is director of the German Development Institute and professor for global sustainable development at the University of Bonn, but today here in Berlin, which is very nice. And uh, the other chair is Sebastian Unger. He is head of the Ocean Governance Research Group. Hello, welcome back. Uh, you may have noticed we ran into some tiny technical uh, difficulties, but we're back again and ready uh, to pick up where we left off. Uh, so here in the studio with me, Sebastian Unger and uh, Professor Dr. Anna-Katharina Hornig, who was in the middle of talking to us. So uh, let's give her the chance to start over again. Anna-Katharina, what's in store for us today? Thanks, Monica. So 2015, uh, the world community came together to decide on 17 sustainable development goals, uh, our common agenda, the Agenda 2030 by the United Nations, as well as um, on the climate goals in Paris, um, deciding and sketching out clear paths towards remaining um, or staying under 1.5 degrees warming or at least under 2 degrees of global warming. And seven years later today, we are in a situation where we realize we are substantially falling behind in reaching um, in aiming for the reach of the Sustainable Development Goals, as well as um, in reducing global warming. We are in a situation of multiple crises at the moment, and we realize the great transformation has to be accelerated and has to be accelerated substantially. That means we are in a situation where we need to um, transform our um, production systems and change our consumption patterns towards um, stabilizing the climate and along and guided by the Sustainable Development Goals um, as, as we've decided on them. And that means for the ocean quite a tension field. It means that on the one side, uh, the interest in its resources is uh, substantially increasing with regard to mineral resources, just as much as with regard to its biological resources. And at the same time, the awareness that we need to protect the ocean um, as, as, a, as a global biodiversity hub, just as much as, as the global climate regulator, and need to assure a sustainable management, a sustainable form of use of um, the ocean and its resources. Now, how do we do that? We do have substantial knowledge, we have um, steering mechanisms, and at the same time, both lacks, lacks um, consistency, lacks continuity, um, lacks also the, the um, the integratedness that is required in order to, to uh, overcome governance fragmentation. And in the coming three days, we will turn towards these questions. And Sebastian, how do we do that? Take us away. Yes, thanks, uh, Anna Katharina. And um, indeed, as, as you said, the next 10 years during the UN decade will be crucial for the future of the ocean. We already have enough knowledge to stop pollution, to prevent overfishing, to protect marine biodiversity, but the complexity of these multiple crises the ocean is faced with requires a much deeper understanding and also new types of solutions to create a transformation towards sustainability. Governance processes are already underway to address some of these challenges. For example, we heard in the opening video about the negotiation of a new legal instrument for the protection of the marine environment beyond national jurisdiction on the high seas. States have agreed now to develop within the next 
two years a new global convention to combat plastic pollution. All this is very encouraging, but all this requires a much better foundation um, of understanding, of knowledge of these problems. In addition, we see new threats emerging. We have new pressures in the ocean coming up, like, for example, from deep seabed mining, climate change, ocean acidification is leaving a much greater mark on the ocean um, now and also as projected in the um, coming years. So all this is the basis where we are now looking um, at the next 10 years and what the UN Ocean Decade needs to deliver. And, and this is the crucial question that we want to address here in an accessible ocean. We will today have two sessions. We will start with the first session to, to discuss what type of knowledge is needed for decision makers, for policy processes to really implement those legal instruments that we are developing, to really make them change makers in the way how we deal with the ocean. We will then look into, um, in a second session today, into um, really exciting science initiatives that provide already inspiring examples how science collaboration across disciplines, across different types of knowledge, are really already delivering some of the knowledge that we need to uh, change um, the way how the ocean is treated. And then, Monica already said, our event is really going over three days. Tomorrow there will be a fantastic um, um, array of site events, of, of um, satellite events taking place all across the different sea basins uh, on, on, the, on the one ocean. And on the third day, we will bring all this together in a synthesis and we'll discuss one of, from my and from our perspective, one of the key questions for the UN decade, and that is what science policy interfaces do we need to really bring the enormous amount of knowledge into policy processes, how to make it actionable. And science policy interfaces really um, need to be strengthened in order to achieve that. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sebastian and uh, Anna Katarina. And uh, as you can uh, imagine now, and, and probably you agree as well, I mean, the world is uh, becoming increasingly complex. The challenges are growing uh, at an increasingly rapid uh, speed, and we have to deal with it. And obviously, knowledge uh, helps us, uh, but it's the kind, the right kind of knowledge, and sharing that kind of knowledge, what it's all about. Uh, so when Sebastian was mentioning the first panel, I immediately had to think about that proverb, you can't see the wood for the trees. Uh, so a lot of knowledge is good, but the first panel is asking the question, what kind of knowledge is needed to support key ocean governance processes? This is a panel that will be hosted by Sebastian, and you are more than welcome to submit your questions. Thanks a lot, Monica, for this uh, kind introduction of our first session on what kind of knowledge is needed to support ocean governance processes for sustainability. And as we already heard in the session, we will reflect on the type of knowledge, the type of, um, of data and information that scientific um, institutions can deliver to support policy processes, to really um, underpin decision-making and governance processes so as to achieve global goals for um, ocean sustainability, such as the 2030 Agenda and the um, goal for the ocean, SDG 14, like um, proposed goals that will be hopefully agreed later this year under the Convention on Biological Diversity to protect at least 30% of the ocean by 2013. All these goals are complex. They are knowledge intense and they require really efficient and effective science policy interfaces. 
And we want to ask not only our panelists that I'm going to introduce in a moment, but also we want to ask you, our participants, and we would like to invite you and, and to encourage you to participate in a poll where we want to ask you, is a new science policy interface for the ocean necessary? And you can give three different answers. So you can say, yes, a new science policy interface is needed. You can say, of course, no, we do not need a new interface. And you can stay in the middle ground and say, science policy interfaces for the ocean should be strengthened, building on existing structures. I'm now really excited to introduce our fantastic panel that uh, we already have with us here on the screen. And let me first introduce um, Mr. Dixon Varungi. Dixon is the coordinator of the Secretariat of the Nairobi Convention. And the Nairobi Convention is the legal instrument, the framework through which the states in the Western Indian Ocean collaborate to protect the marine environment of this highly biodiverse and rich sea basin. Dixon has over 20 years of experience as one of the key figures in UNEP's Regional Seas Program. And he joins us from Nairobi. Welcome, Dixon. Really pleased to have you on board with us today. Thank you so much. We have also with us, and this is fantastic, um, joining us from Bonn, Joanna Post, who works with the UN Climate Secretariat. And Joanna is program officer at the Climate Secretariat, dealing with the nexus between ocean and climate. And Inter Alia really is the person behind the um, dialogues on ocean and climate that are taking place within the Paris Agreement. So welcome, Joanna. We have also with us today Sheila Heymans. Sheila is the executive director of the European Marine Board, really one of the main European science policy think tanks. And she is also the um, professor for ecosystem modeling at the um, Scottish Association for Marine Science. And I'm really happy to have you with us also, Sheila. Thank you. Nice to be here. And last, and but definitely not least, Andrea Weiss, um, who is a um, science officer at the German Environment Agency, and in this position, um, responsible for implementing or coordinating the implementation of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And this is really one of the main, or the main European instruments to um, uh, achieve a healthy um, um, ocean or healthy European seas and in itself an extremely knowledge intense process. So really looking forward to have um, Andrea with us here, who also previously with the OSPA Commission, for example, was um, responsible for developing quality status reports of, um, for the Northeast Atlantic. So welcome, uh, Andrea, in, in this round. So let Thank me you very much. Welcome. <laughs> Excellent. And let me, before we get in, into the discussion, also invite you, our um, participants, our visitors in this, in this um, discussion today, to really engage. This is not a one-way stream, but you can um, ask questions to our panelists also through the chat function. We are monitoring this here on two big screens, and we will take up your question during the panel discussion. So really be invited to, to post questions and use this as an exchange for uh, shaping the UN decade and its activities. Um, and also don't forget to participate in the poll. So let me um, start with, with you, Dixon. Um, Dixon, you're working in the Western Indian Ocean um, in an extremely biodiverse and an extremely rich marine environment that is also increasingly under pressure from climate change, from over-exploitation. The coastal um, areas are suffering um, from, from more and more people moving to the coastal regions from, from inland. Um, so, translating a goal like the sustainable goal SDG 14, that is very sort of high level, into concrete action on the ground in a region like the West Indian Ocean is a complex process that requires a lot of scientific knowledge. 
Could you please share with us some of the experiences that you have in the West Indian Ocean and perhaps also share with us what has really worked well in the past years and where you see um, great challenges in terms of bridging the divide between science and action? Dixon. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sebastian. And uh, that is uh, an extremely complex question because it, uh, it's about everything that we, we do or have been doing for many, for many years. And of course, let me apologize. I'm also not in my office. I'm borrowed. I'm in borrowed space. Uh, not absolutely adequate, but uh, it will do for now. Uh, let, let, let me start by first throwing ourselves back and ask why do we need the science or why do we need to act? Uh, from our perspective, we act because we want to secure uh, the community livelihoods or the well-being of the communities that depend directly on the marine and the coastal resources. And they are many. They're talking about millions of people who depend directly on the marine and coastal uh, resources. Uh, the, the second question I would want to ask is, um, all, all of us scientists and maybe policymakers would throw words like Western Indian Ocean has very high endemism, is a, a very rich biodiverse, uh, is very biode a very rich region, Biode the biodiversity is uh, extremely, extremely rich. But how do those statements mirror the knowledge uh, of the communities that you are likely to support. It's only when you think about what we know about the ecosystems and what we wish the livelihoods of the communities that we want to help is once we relate the two, uh, then it becomes very easy to decide what type of science uh, is, is, is required. And for us, we've already realized that there's a big gap between the scientists, those that, are, those, are, those that are studying the coral reefs or those that are studying the mangroves and all that information, those that are aware of the impacts of ocean acidification, those that are aware of uh, the plastics in the oceans. We know that we have that knowledge, but that how does that knowledge translate into policy? How many policy officers uh, know of uh, these scientific findings? And I would like to throw you back probably to uh, as early as 1995, the Nobel Prize laureate, uh, Wangari Madai from Kenya. We were in a meeting in Madagascar and we are creating a coral reef task force with the deputy minister of environment in Kenya. We are creating a coral, I mean, uh, a mangrove task force and she asked us, what are mangroves? This is one lady that had planted over millions of trees in Kenya, but was not aware of the mangrove trees. So you can, if you take her as an example, then you realize how much more knowledge we have to transmit to the communities. Because at the end of the day, it's the communities that will, will, will conserve, it's the communities that will protect uh, the marine and coastal environment. So our work, uh, and we do have a policy science platform in Western Indian Ocean. Our work primarily is to help translate the science that already is available to the science that communities can use to force policy change. If we get, we, we can translate the science already known to science that can influence policy, we'll have achieved most of our, our, our objectives. And how do we do about, how do we go about that? I wanted to, I will give you an example of what we call the marine protected areas uh, outlook developed from the Western Indian Ocean, it's available in the Nairobi Convention websites. We simply ask, ask all government to tell us how much have they protected up to now. The Western Indian Ocean has not protected more than 7% of the ocean up to now. And does, does that 7% include all the critical habitats? Of course it doesn't include all the critical habitats. Do you know, uh, I mean, the next question is whether governments know which are the critical habitats are not protected. And of course, they didn't know that. And our next output will be a critical habitats outlook that can support governments in making decisions on how they how they get to 30 by uh, 30 by 30% uh, by 30 uh, uh, by, by, by 2030. So it's taking the information that is already known there, is already known, synthesizing, synthesizing that information 
and be able to give that information to policymakers uh, for them to change policy, of course, with the support of communities that do understand why these actions have to be taken. Do all communities support, for instance, um, marine protected areas? No, because the, 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 the tradition has been government declares a marine protected area probably without the, the involvement of communities. We know that's the background. What are the solutions? Madagascar has given us fantastic solutions where you convince uh, local communities to protect locally, uh, local areas and manage those areas as marine protected areas. So we transcend uh, the difficulties that can have been created by irrational introduction of marine protected areas, uh, use new, method, new, new, new methods, and hopefully uh, by 2030 we shall have protected 30% of both inshore or, or EEZs uh, of these countries. I hope that helps. Thank you so much for this really, um, indeed, um, comprehensive um, answers to, to a, a question that uh, actually was, was, uh, or is, was quite complex. And let us come back to a couple of your points later, also throughout the discussion, particularly the one on, on the 30 by 30 goal and the type of knowledge we need really to identify such areas in the regional scale. I think that's really important. But you were mentioning also um, the importance of livelihoods of ocean literacy, um, all different sort of nuanced um, um, expressions of our discussion here. And um, with that, I would like to turn a little bit more to the, to the global policy level and, and ask um, Joanna, because um, I think the, the science community has been really a driving force in the whole climate debate and um, has been also, um, although of course progress in combating climate change is not um, fast enough, but still the, the science community has been really successful in, in driving this debate and putting it um, up front um, in, in um, high level policy making. So could you perhaps please share with us a little bit your views, um, what makes the, the work of um, science policy in the context of climate change? When we look, for example, at the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, and, and when we look at the quite impactful um, um, report on the ocean and the cryosphere in a changing uh, climate, how why is this so impactful and what could the ocean community perhaps also learn from, from um, the success of, of the science policy interface and climate, uh, climate governance? Uh, thank you very much and I will hope to do justice to that question in a few short moments. And, and indeed you're absolutely right, science is the key to driving the policy agenda and parties recognize this in the Paris Agreement. Uh, which is based on implementation of the Paris Agreement, which is based on the best available science. But I'd also stress that it's vital that uh, science responds to the policy needs. So it's not just a give, it's a give and take. Um, and the Paris Agreement actually changed the paradigm on science support on climate change. So we know up until 2015, uh, the IPCC reports kept telling us <laughs> worse and worse news, if you like, and certainly we're trying to... Uh, um, provide the information needed for, for making decisions around climate change. The Paris Agreement recognized that it is a policy document that's legally binding and parties agreed to now implement it and keep 1.5 alive and respond to climate change. So there is a need now for the science to also respond and provide the, um, the information in this solution space. Uh, so moving forward, the way science is done and recognized perhaps needs to respond more and more to these multi and interdisciplinary needs. Um, in terms of the ocean in the climate change uh, conversation, the policy conversation, um, I would argue, and I do argue, that the ocean has been in the UNFCCC mandate since the beginning, but a little bit in hiding. The definition of the, we know it's the driver of the climate system, and we know that in the UNFCCC and the convention, it's the climate system is defined as the totality of the atmosphere, hydrosphere, hydrosphere, I emphasize biosphere and geosphere, and their interactions. And of course, the, the convention is there to limit uh, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere um, before they, they cause harm. And then, of course, moving forward in policy recognition of the ocean, um, in the Cancun agreements, the parties recognize the need to strengthen international cooperation and expertise in order to understand some of these uh, 
the adaptation needs, the loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change and recognized issues such as ocean acidification, sea level rise, um, glacial retreat, um, salinization, and so on. But really the Paris Agreement was the point where there was a real strong emphasis on um, protection of ecosystems, particularly, or including the ocean. Um, moving forward, so there was a real push since Paris to, to recognize the ocean as part of uh, this, uh, not just being impacted, but part of this solution space. And really moving forward quite, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a slow moving process, but we eventually got there in COP25 at the Blue, Blue COP, which of course, as we know, took place just before the COVID pandemic. There was a, really the government's recognized the need to strengthen the understanding of and action on ocean and climate change under the UNFCCC. And we know that this was because the um, special report on ocean and cryosphere came out in that year, 2019, which was a strong basis from which parties were able to recognize the impacts of uh, climate change on the ocean and also the solution space that was also discussed in that special report. Moving on, of course, we, we were mandated, as, as you kindly uh, referred to, mandated to, to, to provide an ocean climate dialogue as part of the mandates coming out of uh, the Madrid-Chile conference. That took place virtually in 2020, and there was a strong emphasis on, OK, based off of what the IPCC is saying, how do we need to strengthen ocean climate actions in terms of the process? and in terms of uh, the practical action at the national and international level, and to break down synergies for action based off of science. So there are still some important questions that the decade is responding to. Um, the ocean to date, we know is the greatest mitigation of climate change. Um, we know that, however, its, the, its role as a carbon sink uh, needs a lot more research to understand the changes and how this uh, will be impacted moving forward. There's a lot of research still to do, but we know that there's enough information to act and to build off of this work to, to really find solution space based off of climate science, both adaptation and, and mitigation. And I'll stop there and hand back to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Joanna. Um, I think that was um, also, I think, a very um, good overview about the progress really made um, in the context of, of the climate and ocean nexus. And I think already very much links to our uh, question that we want to discuss um, with, with you, with Sheila. Um, and that's um, the, 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 the question about um, the, the machinery behind all of that, because um, the data that is used in reports and assessments like, like those from the IPCC. They are produced, they are gathered um, through, um, of course, extensive science programs, data gathering programs, and also assessment um, programs to really get an idea about the state um, of the, of the uh, marine environment and also with its linked um, systems. And the, um, the coherence of this data is very often uh, an, an, a strong issue. And when we say coherence, read really about data formats, data platforms, etc., different systems that might not fit together. But this is one of the key challenges. Um, and also, I think Vladimir Yabin also was, was uh, referring to it in his, his opening statement. So, Sheila, from your experience working with the EMB um, at the sort of really science advocacy um, side of things, but also being a, a real expert um, in ecosystem modeling, so really developing data yourself. Um, what, if, what, what, what is your view on how to best take, how, how to best take this, this forward? Um, yeah, I think, again, <laughs> very, very big questions there. Um, so, so I think one of the most important things that we have to understand is that the ocean is very vast and we don't have actually that much information on, on you know, what, what's out there. So we really need to make sure that, we, that the observations that we take from the ocean uh, are sustained. So we really need to make sure that we, we get the information in. We can make, as a modeler, for instance, I can do lots of fancy models, but if I don't have data to validate my models, then it's just playing with you know, computer code. So what we really need is we need that sustainable data to come in. And what we need to be able to do through the ocean decade uh, is to 
make sure that we advocate for those sustainable observations. Uh, a really good example of how this was done, um, for instance, uh, through the OECD, there was a report last year that came in, uh, OECD Medan report uh, that was also co-hosted by Goose or co-run by through Goose, where they looked at the value of all the public marine data that comes in in the UK. Um, and we really need to do that in every country. We need to do that across the world to make sure that we know what information is there and that we know how it is, uh, how it comes together so that the, the information that Dixon was talking about, the information that Joanna was mentioning that we need in order to look at climate change, that we can really have that information. It's no use that we go out and, and take the, the, um, the measurements, but we don't know it's out there. We don't know how to implement it to help policymaking. Uh, so I think we really need to, to do that well. At the EU level, the uh, European Commission has an initiative out on ocean observations um, and how we can share responsibility within the European Commission to make sure that the, the money we throw at going out and measuring something actually comes back in bringing that data together so that everybody knows what's going on out there. Um, I'm not sure if that really helps or if that answers your question, but um, I think that's that's a good start. I think, say, uh, Sheila, this has been really a very a good start indeed. And we already get um, um, questions also from our um, um, participants online. Um, and, and Sheila, um, one question. Um, um, uh, um, a guest has um, raised to you is actually um, where will all the data go and, and how can we make it accessible for all? You were mentioning initiatives of the EU in the context of big EU uh, projects, but is there something um, on the horizon? Can the um, ocean decade make a difference with, with regard to data accessibility? Yes, indeed. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, there is an ocean data uh, program through the uh, through the through the UN Ocean Decade, and if I'm not mistaken, it's run out of Germany. So you guys are at the center of it all. Um, if uh, I think in Kiel, um, so so I think there is already a lot of work happening in the UN Ocean Decade to make sure that this data comes together. That the really good work that's done at the EU level, but also at, for instance, North America and and other places, that we bring it all together so that. You can then get to the digital twin of the ocean where you can really look at what's going on in the ocean in front of you with all of the data that's already out there. So uh, through the ocean decade, it, it's, it should happen. Yes, thanks a lot, Sheila, and also connecting this, I think some people might think quite technical question, but it really is essential for policymaking, both as we heard from Dixon, for biodiversity at a regional scale, but also for, for uh, the changing ocean, the effects of, of climate change, ocean acidification uh, uh, on the marine ecosystems. And now I would like to um, move to, to Andrea, who um, really works um, 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 at the national level and um, is, as I said earlier before, inter alia, um, coordinating the responses of, of uh, the German government to um, um, marine protection um, issues and implementing, the, uh, for example, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So really, as a, as a somebody working with the government, depending on good data, on good information, on which management decision-making can, can be really um, um, based on. And um, Andrea, um, you also um, um, previously working with the um, OSPA Commission have been um, really um, very much involved in implementing the ecosystem approach at a regional scale, working with data that comes from member states, not from the traditional science institutions, so they're different data that we need to, to also look at and bring together. And, and could you perhaps share with, with us a little bit your um, ideas and also your experience with um, um, working at the national level, how um, complex processes like, for example, the Baltic Sea Action Plan that is really um, um, sort of delivering on multiple goals. Some of them might even be conflicting as we have in the 2030 agenda. And how is it possible to integrate uh, um, this in, in implementing um, policies like the MSFT. Andrea. Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Sebastian. Um, indeed, um, I, I think having um, the opportunity to work together in the regional conventions like with Telcom or with OSPA is a very important step forward to bring things together and also what might seem not to be 
entirely coherent, etc., it might still help to work together in order to interpret data, bring them together, etc. And uh, I think a very important point also raised by um, Sheila was um, th there are there are platforms uh, in in uh, in existence or become existent, which will help us bring the data together. But I think the key challenge for us, use of data is to know where they come from, how to combine them. So there are quite a few challenges linked to that kind of um, uh, bringing things together. Um, you've mentioned regional seas conventions and you've mentioned the EU uh, uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Actually, the last uh, piece of legislation has been a booster for monitoring and data collection, uh, it has really helped, it has boosted this as well at a regional level, not only at a national level, and working together is, has shown real effect in the past um, 10 years. And if you look at Helcom or OSPA for the Baltic Sea or the North Sea, you will see that a numerous um, amount of new knowledge has been created through impetus. Um, obviously, we still have gaps. We still need to learn how to deal with gaps and how to manage our human activities in the seas with these gaps. Um, but uh, I think what's very valuable also is to have science agendas, both from OSPA and HELCOM. Um, the HELCOM science agenda, which was passed 2021 in October, at the ministerial meeting is a very good example of um, bringing together the lack of knowledge, um, the things we need to know, um, the improvement of monitoring systems, um, the need of data that we have um, from a national to the regional level. And it, it is intended also to contribute to the UN decade of science just to help uh, forming a kind of framework to help us making uh, information better accessible, but also generating the information that we need to help us with management of, um, of our human activities. So I think that's quite important to mention, and the science agenda will give you really um, um, a, a spectrum of all sorts of uh, issues, starting from thematic uh, problems like eutrophication, hazardous substance screen down, to topics like uh, holistic assessments or even ecosystem-based management. Um, so that's quite helpful. And I think that's the link uh, that we like to see between science and policy, making sure that we as managers can tell not only at a national but also at a regional collective level where we need um, data, where we need input in order to help us uh, managing um, our activities. Um, perhaps one last point, um, which I just also in response to, to, to uh, Sheila and uh, um, explaining the, the various observations that we, that we are having, etc. I think it's very, very important that we have the possibility to work together on uh, that kind of uh, generating data and information, being very much um, um, sharing or dividing the tasks in the type of data that we are collecting, I think that becomes very, very clear if you have a, a directive like the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which is just asking a lot, and we just don't have the resources to, to manage every single item in uh, individually. So that's why cooperation is so important. That's why initiatives like um, satellite observations through processes or whatever is very, very important and that can help to, um, to divide and share the tasks of monitoring and observations and uh, bring us uh, and help also each of us to focus on what we can best, uh, can do best. Um, that would be my point. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh... Andrea, and um, you already have, have, have outlined quite a number of concrete wishes almost that you, you, that you um, um, direct to the UN Ocean Decade. What could be um, possible uh, outcomes? And, and I think particularly when we look at um, the changing environment um, and the changing ocean, much more of these global observation systems are really required to also predict what is happening. And when one of the key um, uh, points, and let me uh, please uh, come briefly back to you um, that the, also the regional um, um, collaborative efforts like HELCOM-OSPA, but we also heard about the Nairobi 
Economic Convention are doing is also trying to understand what the cumulative effects of different um, activities are on the ocean. That's, that's really challenging scientifically, but it's also ch challenging politically to, um, to really get uh, traction here. And, and could you perhaps, um, I mean, when you look at the 10 years that we, are, that we are, have in front of us of UN Ocean Decade, and when you think about linking, linking these uh, two aspects of cumulative effects, both from a science and from a policy side, do you, do you see a way forward? What, what could, could be really done to, to bring these worlds better together? Mm. Well, cumulative effects is indeed a, a challenge. And what, what I observe is that we have loads of information, knowledge and data from sectors, from private businesses, from state monitoring, um, which could all be brought together. But the challenge is to, uh, to have it together and to allow us really to combine this information in such a manner that we can understand much better the accumulation of pressures and impacts. Um, and especially the impact side of things is uh, really challenging to see uh, that, we, that we get the information that we actually need. Um, I think the, 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 what we've been struggling with a lot is to make sure that whatever kind of data we are collecting for various policies, not only the environmental one, but when we talk about cumulative effects, we look also at fisheries, at shipping, at uh, uh, dredging, at uh, all sorts of activities. Um, when we do so, that we try to make sure that we can use data more easily, that we open the channels talking across the disciplines, across the uh, policy borders, um, and that we that we bring this together. I think there are good initiatives already on, on, on their way to do so, but it's, we, we are not yet there. Um, the other thing is, I think when we talk about cumulative effects, um, we shouldn't overestimate what that tool can do. And sometimes being less complex might help us um, or allowing us really to tackle the key issues and be much more focused than really trying to bring everything into one assessment, all accumulations, etc. That's also one lesson learned because in the end, um, it seems that we end up with a few key factors uh, that really, really matter when it comes to good status or achieving a, um, a better management of the sea. Um, while we could perhaps not neglect, but in, 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 in a cumulative uh, uh, perspective, it's not so important to have minor issues to be looked at. They can be important then at a very local scale, while you look at a particular area which is perhaps uh, of, of, uh, in need of, of action. But when you look at a broader scale, I think um, we might also be more relaxed um, when it comes to that cumulative uh, aspect, because I think we have a good apprehension of what the key issues are and tackling them first might might be a way of characterizing things and not only um, being so dependent then on um, I don't know square square kilometer uh, data which you would need or you would need a high resolution etc just to bring data together and so, something which is really difficult and perhaps one last point some of the data is not accessible especially impact data we have uh, it's very often part of environmental impact assessments and there is a legitimate interest of industry of a business secrecy, so that's that's clear. But it 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 uh, it's another point where it's really difficult then to um, step in as a state or as um, research institutions and to fill particular gaps in knowledge, especially on the impact side of of pressures. I hope that. Answer a little bit to your question. No, thanks a lot, uh, Andrea. And, and this actually also very much reflects um, comments and questions that we have received from, from our audience. So thanks a lot, Andrea, to responding to that. And I think it's, it's very um, um, important, um, as you said, to really understand also the limits and of, of, of the quality of the data to really make sure that policymaking also understands on what um, basis decisions are being taken. That, that's, I think, absolutely critical. And we will come back to that. Um, 
Dixon, I would like to, to come back to you. As, as I said earlier on, you were already talking about marine protected areas or area-based management tools in the West Indian Ocean. I think that's a good example to, to, to really highlight how these different types of knowledge, different sectors are coming together or need to come together in order to, to be effective. And, and we know that um, under the Convention on Biological Diversity within the proposed um, future global biodiversity framework, there is the goal to protect at least 30% of the uh, global ocean. And um, you were uh, referring to the, the number that you have achieved in, in the West Indian Ocean. Some areas uh, might um, claim they have higher percentages. But the question, of course, uh, is not so much about number crunching. Uh, it's about the quality of the management, but it's also of the quality of the um, areas that have been identified. Um, we talk about networks of marine protected areas. Areas. We need to talk about coherence and consistencies so that, for example, migratory species are really um, covered by these um, areas. Um, we link to, to climate change. We heard from Joanna about it. Dixon, could you really, really share with us a little bit um, your um, your lessons learned from the, from the MPA outlook that you already mentioned? Um, how are your, um, your contracting parties um, implementing or planning to move ahead with, with um, achieving these targets for, for MPAs in a meaningful manner and, and taking into account these multiple issues that you mentioned, like achieving and supporting livelihoods, etc. Dixon. Uh, uh, th thanks, uh, Sebastian. Again, uh, a very difficult question. Uh, but let's go back to, I'll go back, as you asked, on the Marine Protected Areas Outlook. Uh, we undertook a survey for all the countries within the Western Indian Ocean, uh, a detailed survey on um, what is the level of protection of all the protected areas in each of the countries. And, and of course, uh, we went into greater details, not only to figure out where is the protected area, but also the management effectiveness of the protected area. And consequently, uh, uh, the outcome was, yes, we do have all these protected areas, but they are not managed effectively. So the next question we ask ourselves is, uh, even if we attain 10 by 20, because it was 10% by 20 in 2020, which we did not attain, but was it 10 by, 10% by 2020 of effectively managed areas or areas that are simply called marine protected areas. And if we trans, if we, we throw that question to 20, 2030, shall we have 30% of areas designated of are uh, designated as marine protected areas with effective management, or there will be 30% manage 30% uh, protected without effective management. And that's a very difficult question because uh, uh, of the resources required to effectively manage the area. Uh, even though there is quite some resources required to manage a protected area, uh, one of the limitations and one of the reasons why these areas are not effectively managed is, uh, as I said earlier, uh, non-commitment of the local communities in such protected areas. Communities around the area not, uh, not being involved in the management. And consequently, that's why we are promoting the locally managed, um, uh, lo uh, locally managed marine, uh, ma ma marine areas where local communities can manage their areas. Now, is that an accepted terminology uh, for marine protected areas? And we do hope that uh, we can develop this, uh, using that experience in Madagascar, we can develop these locally managed marine areas as an alternative to help the, the countries of the region to get to 30% and effectively manage their 30%. Because if we do not get, if we get to 30% without effectively managing the 30%, then 30 by 30 is, is still, uh, uh, will still be a, uh, uh, a dream, a, bit, a dream too far to, to, to attain. And then let me, while saying so, um, probably allude to the fact that 
Yes, we do need information. Yes, we do need data. Data is generated at the local level or at the national level. Data is generated, uh, uh, policy is implemented at the local level or the national level. So what we need is local level data, local level, uh, local level uh, inform information sharing because that's where actions will be. Policy changes at the local level. So we also have to understand that if you want to influence policy change or you want a policy science interface that is effective, we have to realize that policy change must happen at the national level. So we generate data that is relevant at the national level where politics inform policy change. Not forgetting that, we are also in a very fluid space called ocean. Um, because the ocean so interconnected, impacts generated or impacts from one country can very quickly uh, translate into impacts into a neighboring country. Fisheries, fisheries is an example. Migratory fishermen is an example. Uh, migratory fishermen from one country could impact uh, fisheries in a protected area in a neighboring country. So that's where collaboration at the regional scale or generating data that is relevant at the regional scale becomes uh, very important. Consequently, the collaborative efforts of regional scale institutions to be able to have that data that enable regional scale decision making is equally important. And once you've generated national data, regional data, then we shall be, uh, uh, as our colleague said there, be able to feed the, glo the global data databases for easy modeling of the ocean. I'll stop there, I hope that helps. Thanks, thanks a lot, Dixon, and uh, I think this very much links to also what Andrea was just saying. Um, and, and I mean, there is a huge investment for the national level to collaborate uh, regionally. But, uh, but I think you, you, you have really made a very strong case again, in addition to Andrea, why this is so needed and why this is um, so crucially uh, important. And uh, Dixon, we got a, I think, a question from from the audience that fits very nicely to to what you just said um, with regard to the locally managed marine protected areas. And the question is, uh, and you can answer, I think, very, very shortly, do we need stronger top-down mandates and support, or do we need more organized bottom-up engagement and direction by the communities? Um, we, we need both, because the finances will have to flow from top-down, but the effectiveness must be generated from the bottom-up. So we do need to bring the two processes to, together, uh, where, where Central, central government, for instance, uh, adopts, regulated, uh, adopts or regulates the locally managed areas, or the communities come together. Of course, the communities come together, decide they want to protect an area, but they also need uh, support from the central, the central government, as it were. So that we, we, we need both, we, we do need both uh, parties to, uh, to participate in locally managed uh, marine areas. Expecting you to provide this uh, this uh, answer, but but perhaps it's really the case that in the past there's been more focus on the top down, and that really new approaches like like these locally managed MPAs can really empower uh, people um, in in those those effective affected uh, regions. Um, Joanna, I wanted to to really come back to you and the discussion on um, the relation between climate and and ocean and governance, and I think it's a very uh, positive development that we have witnessed in the the past years and you were explaining how this all uh, came about that uh, that um, ocean and climate are really um, um, now also in governance are more thought together but still we we still have this divide between the climate regime and the um, ocean uh, governance and let's not start a discussion on whether this is good or bad there are different different views around it but but science could be really a, a tool to bridge um, this divide, and, and perhaps not only science, but um, sort of mutual and collaborative understanding and, and knowledge um, creation process could bridge this. And, and, and there have been good examples um, in, uh, in the IPCC uh, in the past. Um, could, you, could you perhaps um, yeah, give us an, um, an idea how this could perhaps really help to, to further bridge this, this divide between those governance worlds? Yes. Thank you very much uh, for 
great question. I wish I had a, a, um, a time to debate it, but I'll try and do my best in a few short moments. And I, I think, uh, as you rightly said, uh, that decision making around the ocean, the decision making around climate change, um, have often sat uh, separate from each other often due to the fact that they've been addressed by different ministries and governments. Um, but we know also that uh, as that uh, governance or climate change ocean governance is undergoing a transformation based very much on new developing information, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary scientific approaches to, to looking at how climate change is impacting the ocean and the solution space, as I mentioned earlier supported by strengthened observation systems, strengthened research, but with, as Andrea rightly said, there's a, there's a lot more to, to go on both of those aspects. Now, the UNFCCC is a party-driven process, so we talk about uh, perhaps not the um, BBNJ, not the, the work beyond national jurisdictions, but certainly uh, the ocean, the coastal zone in within a, a national jurisdiction, and I think this is really a melting pot for decision-making moving forward, ecosystem degradation, fisheries, um, uh, emissions reductions through, um, through transport, through fisheries also. Um, there's, a, there's a really a need for a strengthened ocean climate research to make decisions on in this very complex space that involves climate, ocean, biodiversity, spatial planning, but a lot of opportunities as well in terms of uh, it's not just a space where impacts happen, but where solutions can, can take place, whether that be through ecosystem based solutions, whether that be through green gray infrastructures, whether that be thinking about, you know, um, uh, land to ocean uh, solutions for, for, for removing um, pollution and, and plastics and so on. So um, under the FCC, of course, the, the Parties uh, provide their nationally determined contributions, which are basically a written document to say what they want, what they will do to respond to climate change. And I think this is a space where parties can bring in these uh, solutions based around ocean for both mitigation for adaptation, also for, for uh, early warning systems. And it's, it's the first stop, if you like, in, in the Paris Agreement where parties recognize and identify what they're going to do, whether that be conditional based off of, of course, funding, and there needs to be some strength, a lot of strengthening of, of ocean climate finance and funding within this space as well. Um, but it's a communication from parties that shows how they're going to implement the Paris Agreement, and it's a basis for action, it's a basis for identifying funding needs and ultimately reporting progress and uh, taking stock at the global level. And, um, there's a couple of examples, I think, that, that can, can illustrate the, the potential here of, of breaking down the silos that needs to be broken down in this decision and solution space. So um, Costa Rica, for example, updated their NDC recently. It includes initiatives to protect and preserve wetlands and nature-based solutions. It includes protecting, restoring marine and coastal ecosystems as a cost-effective means of addressing climate change and protecting biodiversity. So there's a lot of synergies between the FCCC and the work of the CBD, particularly this year with the first 2020 um, decision. Uh, and Costa Rica is also accounting for its coastal wetlands, greenhouse gas fluxes in its GHG inventory. So there's uh, local-based blue carbon solutions. And, um, and research is needed, of course, to better understand some of the solution space and some of these opportunities as well um, for, for really strengthening, um, bringing in that information at NBCs and then acting on it. Um, Seychelles is another example I'd like to highlight. They've taken the lead in pursuing, very much pursuing innovative finance solutions for the conservation and climate adaptation through a debt for nature swap and the sovereign blue bond. Um, uh, so this work includes ecosystem-based adaptation through supporting MPAs, as Dixon referred to, and making key investments in the fishery sector while engaging local communities. So Seychelles is now undertaking quite ambitious cutting edge scientific work to map seagrass meadows across its exclusive economic zone, which also feed into blue carbon solutions for, for the Seychelles. So we have a complicated um, space, but we have science that of course needs to be strengthened to understand some of these impacts, including on ocean acidification, 
needs to be strengthened in terms of understanding some of the solutions, such as uh, blue carbon or uh, new opportunities for, for blue carbon ecosystem based adaptation. But there's a lot of solutions there. Um, so it's, if you like, the, the bottom up has to match the top down. It's not one or the other. It's obviously bottom up uh, solution space supported by international processes to break down some of these synergies to support countries meet demands of, of very different agendas. Uh, from, from speaking from the UN perspective, across the UN perspective, to to but to bring in some of the synergies both at the regional and the regional uh, level support can also provide that as well. So I'll stop there and hand the floor back to you. No, thank, thanks a lot, uh, Joanna. Um, I think um, these points with regard to synergies that you have highlighted are really key. And, and we were talking about the costs of integrating the difficulties of, of gathering this data. But, but I think you have highlighted so nicely the benefits that we, that we get because we much better understand now what are really co-benefits between climate um, um, adaptation and mitigation and protecting marine biodiversity and also delivering for, for local livelihoods, um, for example, through restored coastal ecosystems that you mentioned. Also, I think the example from um, the Seychelles, Seychelles really speaks for, for itself. And um, with that, I would like to to move um, a little bit um, further on this on this very topic, um, and Sheila um, ask you, um, um, Dixon and and also Joanna, we're talking about um, really the engagement of local communities and and creating benefits for local livelihoods, and that's that of course uh, brings in the question for science how to integrate this type of knowledge. In the past, there's been a quite strong divide between sort of real science, sort of science. Um, um, driven uh, processes and then layman's knowledge, if I, if I may so. But there is now a strong move also in the process of, of knowledge generation to integrate different types of, of knowledge, for example, from practitioners, but also from, from local communities, indigenous people, um, etc. And, and we have been working quite a bit on, on these methods of co-design and, and transdisciplinarity with the European Marine Board. Could you, could you um, tell us a little bit what can be expected for the ocean decade, particularly with regard to these concrete issues that, that Dixon, and, and Sheila, uh, Dixon sorry, and Joanna were talking about? Yeah, thanks. Indeed, I think um, one of the things that we've been highlighting at the Marine Board uh, for the last probably three, four years now is that we really need to move away from intern multidisciplinary to transdisciplinary work. We really need to go from, you know, having different uh, fields of science and, and not just natural science, but social sciences and humanities and local knowledge all working separately. And we need to basically come together. Uh, I heard the, the analogy of it's like baking a cake. You know, you have eggs and you have all these things. You need to bring everything together to make a cake. So we need to really... Um, find ways to, to co-design our ecosystem-based management so that everybody has a stake in it, so that everybody feels engaged and that everybody can actually, um, yeah, I mean, uh, get buy-in so that everybody actually agrees that this is the way to do that. So in order to do that, you need to have strong in transdisciplinarity in, in your teams. You can't just have natural sciences. You can't just have social scientists and humanities. And of course, all of this is much harder because we don't speak the same, same language. Um, uh, Dixon has, has already mentioned that, that scientists and, and local uh, communities and scientists and policymakers don't understand each other and speak the same language. So we, if, you, if you do multiples of those, then it's really, it needs a lot more time and we really need to be sure that we do this well. So if we are going to make, uh, if we're gonna make this work and we have to make this work in order to, to you know, get to a, a, the end of the ocean decade with something that works, we really need to find a way to fund this properly. Uh, we really need to find a way of making sure that you have pre-designed stages in your, in your project so that you can actually get to understand each other first before you, you do these kind of, um, th these, these kind of projects. Um, there's some good examples. For instance, the Belmont Forum uh, funds those kind of projects. So there's ways of doing this. And sometimes it's also important that, you know, when you when you submit a proposal, for instance, that, that you don't have to have all the answers, but actually say, this is sort of what you want to try and address. And through the process, you might change your methods because you will have different, different knowledge systems coming in. A really good example 
from the, the field of fisheries is some work that I did when I was still a practicing scientist um, with uh, a, a local fishers knowledge in the Irish Sea, for instance, where we actually asked the, the fishers of the Irish Sea, how do you think the fisheries had uh, changed over time and use that information in a, in a sort of um, non-numbers way to drive out our, our, our models, for instance. So if you do it well and you spend the time and you and you have you actually uh, um, you have respect for each other's knowledge systems, then you can really improve your outcomes from science from a scientific point of view. But you need you need to take the time, and I think that's the important thing. This is not as easy as just running a model. This is actually speaking to people, which you know for for some 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 scientists that's really hard speaking a language that you don't understand even if it's all English. Thanks, thanks uh, uh, a lot, um, Sheila. And I think this point of, of long-term investment and continuity that really also speaks to, to what the UN Ocean Decade hopes to achieve. And let's really hope um, you provided some, some really good examples how this, how this could function, that, that this will be also uh, integrated much more actively in, in the ways how, how science is um, translated and made actionable for, for policy making. And um, I want to, to um, move a little bit um, f um, further now in our, in our discussion and um, ask um, Andrea. So we, we talked um, already a lot about you know, issues that are uh, the policy makers that societies are well aware of, you know, pollution, loss of biodiversity, climate change. But then there are new pressures on the horizon that, that might also have a future um, a quite impact, um, strong impact uh, on the ocean. And your, your agency, the uh, Environment Agency, also has an advisory role for, for the German government and you um, take part also, or your colleagues, in international negotiations. So my question would be from this sort of horizon scanning and, and monitoring role, do you, do you see sort of challenges, emerging issues uh, on the horizon that really need um, our attention and where we lack at the moment sufficient data and where, where science should really um, um, get, a, get a head start. Andrea. Thank you, Sebastian. Well, I, I think I would come back to the biggest uncertainty we have and the biggest challenge, and that is um, bringing in climate change in management. I think that's such an uh, ancillary driving force um, that we definitely need to be get a better grip uh, on when we look at management of other human activities, simply because it drives uncertainties, not only in relation to how our ecosystems change, but also it changes the drivers that we have. It changes the human activities possibly, which might shift from one area to another, from one intensity to another, and it may change our, the pressures that we are seeing. Um, so I think that's that's certainly one of the, um, not really emerging, but one of the urgent um, elements that we need to look at. And, uh, and um, um, Joanna very well put it, we would need to bring down the, the silo. So what we really have to look at is to make management climate proof, to look at how can we reconcile our various targets that we have. Um, that, we, that We want that marine protection and climate protection go hand in hand. They shouldn't rival. Um, and that's quite a huge challenge. And getting, getting this balance right is, uh, is, is really, really difficult. Um, and what I would see um, as, uh, so it's, it's not so much on a specific topic, but rather on the way, how do we come to measures in the future? I think given these uncertainties that we are having, we probably would need to rely much stronger on uh, scenario-based advices, on using models to devise measures, also to using foresight. And I think it has been said previously as well, allow ourselves to say what we decide today is not sizzled in stone. We are a learning process. And we should just accept that our knowledge is changing um, and that we can adapt. And I believe that Corona has taught us quite, quite an important lesson on that, how we need to engage in an iterative process of science, 
management, science, management. It, it needs to be a constant uh, dialogue. That, so that would be my, my response to your question about it's not really the emerging, uh, particular topical emerging issue, but it's more this general issue about um, getting to grips with uncertainty such as climate change and beyond. I think it's very important that we accept that we have to do a good management of our human activities using the precautionary principle, which is exactly acting while we do not have all knowledge and all data at hand. And I think that's that's where I think we need a very good dialogue with, with science to see that we manage this kind of gap. How can we act in a sensible way, not postponing action, but act now while accepting that there are gaps in knowledge? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Andrea, and um, we are slowly have to, to come to, to, a, to a close of this uh, exciting discussion. But I just wanted to take up one more question from, from the audience. And, and um, um, I think, Joanna, this is uh, mostly directed uh, to you, but also taking up a previous point from, from Dixon. And this is about um, how, to, um, how to, I mean, bring forward or what could be a way to, to advance um, ocean and climate policy in a way so that they are working more closely together. And we were talking about synergies between both fields. We have more findings about the effects, for example, of trawling on habitats, but also releasing vast amounts of, of greenhouse gases. So the, the, the knowledge is there. But do you see a way how, how, how policy can be brought closer together? And you have 30 seconds to answer that. <laughs> Actually, uh, a great question. Um, we are certainly working on that from the FCCC perspective. And as I mentioned, trying to encourage the bluing of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and we will have a dialogue on that in our June session and, and bring that conversation also to the UN Ocean Conference, which is coming up in June. I would uh, suggest to the, the person who's, uh, who's asked that question that it's not as if it hasn't started. So it, there is a lot of research, a lot of work already going to bring the climate ocean work together, I would suggest there's a transformations document by the high level panel on ocean economy, which uh, addresses some of those conversations and to look at making uh, our seas, our coastal zones certainly 100% sustainable, bringing in the livelihoods conversation as well. Yeah. So perhaps uh, there's a good pointer to do some extra reading after this, yeah. to look at the high level panel on ocean economy work on transformations. Thanks Back for, to you, Chair. Thanks a lot. <laughs> for creating this link to this indeed excellent work of the of the high level panel uh, with this we unfortunately have to come to a close thank you so much dixon joanna sheila and andrea this has been a wonderful and very uh, inspiring discussion i have three take-home messages um, that i just wanted to briefly summarize we really need collaborative efforts at different scales from the national across sectors to the regional and global level Continuity is important to engage with stakeholders, with um, different types um, of knowledge, and um, we need to create synergies between the different um, policy arenas and associated uh, knowledge systems. And uh, we will take this forward and, and we'll hear more about it in the following session. So thanks again to, to you. Have a good afternoon. And with that, I hand over uh, back to Monica Jones. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. And thank you also to this, this fantastic panel. And as you just said, I mean, yes, this panel had to come to a close uh, because time is never our friend with these events. But there is another panel, an exciting one that is looking at how science supports the sustainability transformation coming up after a break, because I think we all can do with just getting up, stretching our legs, having a cup of tea, coffee, orange juice, whatever, open the window, fresh air. But in 10 minutes, you should be back fresh and full of excitement for our next panel session. So see you then.
Hello and welcome back to our Ocean Decade Laboratory and Accessible Ocean. Uh, this is, if you like, the second part of this core event. We just had a very insightful, exciting, and even though it was an hour long, too short panel session discussing knowledge sharing, the, the need for knowledge for the right data, all of which is important to guide the implementation of global ocean goals, taking into account policy instruments such as the 2030 Agenda, Biodiversity, climate change and how to balance that with ocean protection and sustainability, pollution, multiple stresses from human activities, you name it. All of that was uh, discussed, not only touched upon, but discussed in the previous session. And before we come to the next session, which is uh, really looking into uh, the role of science and the kind of uh, support that science can and should offer in order to enable a sustainable transformation, let me remind you that uh, your expertise is needed, not not just now during the laboratory, uh, but also throughout the entire ocean decade, because the uh, I, uh, C UNESCO Secretariat and the UN Ocean Decade Coordination need your support, and they established the so-called expert roster, which you can join and give strategic technical uh, support, also help with review processes. All of that would help you find the link to it there. So if you haven't done so already, then do take a closer look. And if you can uh, find some time for it, then do give the IOC UNESCO and the Ocean Decade your support and your expertise. Right, so without further ado, let's uh, turn to our second panel discussion, which again starts with a question. What does science offer in support of sustainability transformations? And this time, this uh, panel discussion will be in the safe hands of uh, Anna Katerina, our laboratory chair. And uh, Anna Katerina, I look forward to the discussion. Over to you. Thanks, Monica. Um, Hi everybody, it's it's good to see all of you um, uh, again and um, I would like to especially welcome our five panelists. Um, we now move, Monica already said, this, said so, into uh, the panel asking the question, well, what does science already offer um, in support of, of uh, sustainability transformations? And one could probably add, um, how can science also um, um, benefit actually from, in many ways, um, co-thinking the aspect that science in many ways is always, Im is always partial. And what does that then mean for, um, for, uh, for f scientific progress, but also for policy making? Now, I would like to introduce you to our five panelists from all over the globe. And um, first of all, I would like to introduce you to Daniel Dunn. Daniel is um, the director um, of the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation Science at the University of Queensland. And he's heading a project, coordinating a project that looks at um, migratory um, marine species and their, their patterns of migration. Um, and well, I'm really looking forward to the discussions with you, Daniel. Thanks for joining. I then introduce you. you to to Karen, Karen Evans. Karen Evans is Principal Research Scientist at the Commonwealth um, Scientific Industrial Research Organization, CSIRO, here with a focus on oceans and the atmosphere in Hobart, Tasmania, in Australia. Um, thanks for joining us. This is definitely a long distance call, so to say, um, and it's great to have you here, Karen. Thanks. Um, great to I, be here. Yeah. Thanks. I introduce you to Jacqueline Uku. Jacqueline is a... Hi, hi. Good to see you again, Jacqueline. Um, Jacqueline is the, the president of WIOMSA, the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association. Um, and she is a seagrass uh, specialist with CAMFRI, with the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute in Mombasa. She's been contributing to the national environmental policy of Kenya and is in her role as the president of WIOMSA supporting the Kenyan team for the high level panel for ocean science. It's great to have you here, Jacqueline. And I introduce you to Marai Roberts. 
Mara is a um, professor of applied marine biology and ecology at the University of Edinburgh's School of Geosciences, and he's coordinating um, a European uh, finance project, Horizon 2020 finance project, called I Atlantic, um, which focuses on, um, or he, in his in his role as a researcher within the project, finances uh, fo focuses on structural habitats in the deep ocean. I think it's actually one of the biggest um, research endeavors covering the Atlantic and it will be um, interesting to discuss and hear more about it. Thanks for joining, Mari. And last but certainly not least, I welcome Anya White. Anya is Associate Vice President for Research focusing on the ocean at or off Dalhousie University and she's the CEO and the Scientific Director of the Ocean Frontier Institute. Anya is um, actually a former colleague from the University of Bremen and she's had many different positions so I'm really looking forward um, to discussing with you. She is similarly as, um, as uh, Karen involved in Goose and we will hear, yeah, we are looking forward to hearing your experiences um, from Goose on, on building the science policy interface. So let's start and we'll kick off with a question to you, Daniel. Now you focus on um, marine migratory species and on land and within human history, travelers and in many ways also migrants have offered um, us to learn about different cultural spheres, to learn about different climatic zones. They have often sort of acted as, as the door to the world in many ways, to communities. Is there any parallelity um, when you look at marine migratory species? Yeah, wow, that's it's a really uh, interesting question and a really interesting way to, to kick us off. So thank you for the, the question and thank you to uh, the laboratory for the, the opportunity to participate. Um, so first of all, I think uh, I want to point everybody to the Convention on Migratory Species, which has a whole program of work on culture in migratory species. I think that's a really um, critical uh, uh, and novel thing that that uh, particular policy arena um, has taken on board. Uh, and there's some really, really interesting um, portions of that. I, I think some of my favorite examples are, are examples of uh, where even the migratory behavior itself is a learned cultural transmission. Uh, the migratory routes are transmitted culturally between um, generations. Um, there's also a really, really good example from out here in the, in the Pacific of the South Pacific Whale Research Consortium um, and others who are looking at similar things where whales songs are being transmitted uh, across ocean basins where a whale will start a song um, in, on one side of the ocean and the other whales will learn that song and it will be transmitted across the ocean from one side to the other and they can track how that song is being uh, sort of learned by new groups of, of whales. So really, really interesting uh, ways that this is, we see the sort of um, cultural transmission uh, in a similar way that you might see in, in humans. I think maybe a little closer to the, the topic of uh, an accessible ocean. Uh, I think there's a lot that um, we are doing now and to make some connections here to Goose uh, that's, that are happening in particular with the, the Animal Born Ocean Sensors Program, a new network of Goose, uh, which is essentially is taking, um, utilizing devices that are already being put on um, migratory species to sort of understand their movements and uh, utilizing the uh, oceanographic information that is being um, captured by those sensors and including them within the, the, the goose system. So um, one of the reasons is this is really important is because they're able to go places that we don't go. So we're able to learn things from these animals in a way that uh, we wouldn't be able to learn at least very easily if we were out there trying to do the sampling ourselves. Um, Karen knows about this very well uh, and actually Murray as well, um, all of you I assume. Uh, that the further we get away from um, uh, the coast, the harder it is to sample these things. If you're sampling under sea ice in the Antarctic, it's really great to have a seal that's going to go and do that for you um, uh, just by virtue of their normal uh, movement patterns rather than um, uh, relying on humans to do that. And, it, and it's not just those oceanographic samples that, uh, that we can um, learn from in these, uh, with some of these programs, but actually these days we're, we're able to really start to understand um, the health of distant marine ecosystems by the um, sort of uh, body status of uh, animals um, as they uh, move back towards us, or if we take pictures, 
uh, with drones and various other things, by just by looking at the body size of the migratory species, we can begin to understand some of the dynamics that are happening in those distant places. So they're transmitting that information to us simply by their existence and by coming uh, in um, to contact with us so that we can see uh, how they're doing. Because they integrate, because these animals integrate over such a large being able to tell us um, how it's being transmitted, uh, um, what the ocean, what the status of ocean health is in that particular area. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I think we'll, we'll dig deeper into that, also with reference to the 30 by 30 goal, um, for which, of course, these, these studies are highly relevant as well. But um, I would like to first bring, bring everyone on board and into the conversation and um, would now move to you, Karen. Um, Karen, you are involved, um, I understand, as co-chair of the Goose Biology and Ecosystems Panel at the moment in the third, into the, you're involved in the third cycle of, of carbon out, um, scoping out the assessments. And maybe you can share a little um, your experiences with, uh, within that cycle and maybe even some of the assessments. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, what I'm involved with is known as uh, the regular process, um, which is a UN uh, initiative which is run through the Division of Oceans and Law of the Sea. And it produces approximately every five years what is known as World Ocean Assessment. Um, and as you did mention, we're into the third cycle of uh, the regular process and in that planning phase for uh, what the outputs from the regular process will actually look like. And um, these assessments um, and associated uh, summaries uh, are similar, uh, I guess, um, or in line with uh, those that are produced uh, from uh, bodies such as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Intergovernmental Panel on um, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services reports. And they're really grounded in science. And I guess this is where the connect between science um, and information that is used for decision making and policy making um, really comes to the fore because they have the purpose of bringing together the most up to date information. Um, published through peer review um, publications, but also through uh, national, regional um, and global reports to really provide an integrated view of uh, the state of the ocean. Um, and um, in thinking about the state of the ocean, how humans use the ocean as well and what impacts uh, we're having on the ocean um, through that use um, and what are some of the tools that we can use um, to ensure sustainability of that use of the ocean. And that, uh, that input into those assessments is guided by and um, produced by multidisciplinary expert teams. Um, that evaluate the literature um, and also highlight where we have key knowledge gaps. And that's really important for driving the science forward. So it's not just about taking the science, translating it into something that decision makers and policy makers can use um, to uh, set management goals, sustainability goals, but it's also about highlighting where we need uh, more science, more information, and where we um, perhaps need to build more capacity uh, amongst um, particular regions so that we can build the science in that region, build the understanding and translate that information into key information that policy makers can use. Um, so as you said, we've just um, entered the uh, third cycle um, and we're currently in the process of scoping um, a suite of uh, regional workshops. And those regional workshops are really, um, really key to the whole process because it's through those, those workshops that we actually, um, we uh, decide on what the assessment should look like. So should they be thematic? Should it be a, a fully uh, integrated, um, huge view of the world, which is um, uh, 
kind of uh, the focus that we've taken in the past? Um, and what is it that decision makers actually want? What is the information that they will find most useful? Um, and so those workshops are starting in July and they'll run through the rest of the year. And on the basis of those uh, workshops, we'll, um, we'll decide on the real focus of um, either a assessment or a series of assessments. Um, I can't really give you um, any insight into what they might lo look like um, because it's still a work in progress. But the key here is really to identify what information um, decision makers will find find most useful moving forward in being able to make those decisions um, that ensure sustainability of the oceans. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Karen. Um, Jacqueline, uh, countries in East Africa have, have a long tradition actually in marine research and mm -hmm. WIOMSA is um, sort of taking the lead role in, in organizing um, uh, and bringing marine science expertise together also for policy making uh, processes. What's your, what's your experience here um, with regard to bringing these uh, regional, um, regional level expertise then also into, into global processes? How do you reflect on that? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to participate. Um, as I prepared for this um, talk and to share, I, I found that we indeed, uh, WAMSA has played a more recent role in consolidating scientists' data, building capacity and bringing a research community together around the Western Indian Ocean. But we've had marine stations collecting data in our region from as early as 1930s, where we've had the Inaka Marine Biology Station in Mozambique. Uh, 1951, we've had the East African Marine Fisheries Research Organizations um, just doing data collections and we still have um, publications and data sets from that time. We also have um, indigenous knowledge that is traditionally passed on from generation to generation through songs, drawings, tales, dances, not necessarily written uh, and not necessarily in any database, but a body of knowledge that we are quickly losing due to its oral nature. So I just wanted to highlight the type of data sets that we have. Um, I do believe that enhancing the participation of Goose uh, and regional alliances is really important for our region to link us into national, regional, uh, in situ observing systems, remote sensing, oceanography, and meteorological systems, getting that data in. And there's great advantage in making the link of this uh, data to the needs of coastal populations and capabilities at regional and national uh, levels. But the one thing that um, we need to do is enhance visibility for such initiatives. And um, I think the questions that people would ask, uh, and maybe from our region, another region, is what are the rewards for data providers? Um, considering and making it uh, particularly visible in terms of co-authorship, data set citation, uh, monographic literature on species and groups of species that people can put together, citations, uh, extending editorial board participation for African experts or experts in our region. And um, these efforts, um, you know, are critical for us uh, in making sure that then the data that is national and regional can have a global reach and making sure that it's visible and that um, there is a buy-in by the, those that are collecting uh, the data sets. I just want to reflect briefly on the fact that um, the first ocean decade was based on the science we wanted uh, to better understand our ocean and seas. And that decade uh, is long past, uh, but I think countries, especially in our region are still in that decade, still collecting data, still trying to understand their oceans. We are now in the second decade and we are privileged 
to have a second round at it, a second round and a second boost to our engagement with the ocean uh, in this decade uh, that we are entering for the science we need for the ocean we want. And this decade is expected to enhance science to policy, strengthen the management of our oceans and coasts based on good scientific data. But even as we look at the scientific data, we need to consider the place of local knowledge in the development of the ocean we want, because that ocean belongs to the scientists in as much as it belongs to the communities, which rely on its resources. So we need to consider, as we look at data gathering and data enhancement, uh, cross-disciplinary co-creation of uh, data sets that can be used, uh, especially for regions that have special needs to create um, the science we need uh, and to speak into issues of communities in a very, very um, uh, powerful way. We need to be flexible as we work with data, its acquisition, storage, processing and sharing uh, and control. And um, I think work through um, just harnessing, you know, understanding what exists in regions like ours through maintenance of directories of marine related institution experts in academia, research and management, where obviously the, the data will go towards management and understanding their needs and uh, mobilizing this data when uh, that need uh, arises. I'd like to close with an African proverb that says knowledge is like a garden. If it's not cultivated, it cannot be harvested. If you don't make efforts to acquire the data, the knowledge, uh, be it the indigenous knowledge that is disappearing, then we would not expect to have it. And if we do not put that data, that the little that we have to use, we will not expect to gain anything from it. So we need to understand this, I think in the context of the wheel, to be able to leverage and support um, initiatives like Goose and other uh, data uh, networks that uh, can help us contribute more effectively in this decade. Thank thanks, you. thanks, Jacqueline. Um, we will uh, come back to the to to the question of how to actually, um, you know, which, which kind of avenues would you see in order to integrate um, different forms of knowledge, also local knowledges, uh, traditional knowledges that are not written down, as you that as you also mentioned here, um, how they can be actually integrated into into global uh, fora. But um, I'll first uh, bring in um, also. Uh, Mari and, and Anya, of course. And uh, Mari, um, you are heading the well, one of the largest scientific international assessments of the Atlantic Ocean, if I may say so. And um, this is financed uh, through regional bodies, through the European Union. While most of our, um, our science systems, if you look at it from a macro level, um, uh, basically out of a global perspective, are nationally organized. Um, the usual funding that we receive comes through national um, channels and there is a national agenda setting process that at least is um, involved to some degree. So what's your perspective on how much the, the funding um, infrastructure basically that enables the iAtlantic project, a European Union uh, funding line, um, affects basically the type of research that is being done and how that then also um, can be used in policy advisory processes. So basically, no, does it does it add legitimacy? Does it change um, the science policy interaction simply because of the different type of funding? Thanks. Thank you, uh, Anna, Katerina. Thank you very much, and, and also thanks for the chance to be present today. Really, really appreciate that. So it's a, it's a super question, and I think I wanted to start in terms of representing the team behind the I Atlantic project by just saying how important it is that we're still present in the ocean, we're still monitoring, measuring, understanding this vast ocean. Uh, the Atlantic alone is 20% of our planet. You know, the deep areas of the Atlantic remain uh, largely unexplored, even though the North Atlantic, one might argue, is probably the best explored area of the deep sea anywhere on planet Earth. So what is the Atlantic approach? And I will talk about the funding that, that underlies that. The approach, in essence, is to conduct a health check 
of deep and open ocean Atlantic ecosystems. So how on earth do you do that? You know, this is a vast area of, of the planet. Well, we focused in on certain key uh, ecosystems that provide very important services. For instance, those are structural habitat providers, uh, like the deep corals and sponges of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the Atlantic. Now, there are projections uh, that as a result of climate change, and, uh, and over top of the uh, direct um, effects of climate change, acidification, warming and deoxygenation, we see destructive human activities. Daniel mentioned the damage of deep water bottom trawling. We see the emerging uh, prospects of deep sea mining. But those climate change impacts alone are going to lead to an Atlantic that is no longer suitable for many of these very important habitats. And in the public uh, arena, that's largely unknown. So I Atlantic is able to leverage European Union funding through a, a political declaration that was signed in Bel Air in, in Portugal in 2017 that allows us to fund colleagues in the South Atlantic, particularly in Argentina, Brazil, South Africa, uh, in terms of iAtlantic. And we can work then all together in a unified manner because at the heart of these projects it's not understanding just the ecosystems in isolation, it's working and building our human capacities to deal with the challenges that we're facing. So in iAtlantic, we have a vast um, effort on sharing those capacities and enhancing the human and technical capacities to make the measurements that we need. A couple of examples. We didn't need to uh, reinvent the wheel. The physical oceanographic community have tremendously well-developed um, uh, monitoring capacities in the Atlantic Ocean, but we can supplement and add to those. So we are doing so by adding new sensors into the Southern Ocean, to the South Atlantic, sorry, to look at oxygen um, concentration in, in, in great detail. Uh, we build on work that was done in the North Atlantic in previous funding, looking at more bio biogeochemically relevant uh, fluxes of nutrients in the, in the North Atlantic. And that physical foundation underpins everything that we then do. We can't understand these ecosystems in isolation. We need to understand if indeed overturning circulation, that big um, overturning of the Atlantic Ocean is changing. We have to understand what that means in terms of how ecosystems are connected today, what the changes we may see in the future could be. And the Bellum statement and the ability to seamlessly fund things has been vital. I can't really overstate how important that is. And I hope that in the future, as we move further into this decade, of ocean science for sustainable development. We see clever brokering of partnerships between those that fund research, not just between North and South, but also East to West. So the Americans, Canadians and Europeans can work seamlessly with jointly funded activities. It's very risky to build programs of work where one side of the equation is funded and the other is not. You wouldn't do that in any other form of human endeavor, uh, but we seem to do that in the oceans quite a lot. So I would always argue for that, that brokering uh, between those that hold the purse strings. I think the political statements, Anna Katrina, have taken us a long way. Uh, I'd also, also like to mention in the North Atlantic, the Galway Statement signed in 2013. But we need to see the direct exchange of funds. And when we have that, the community out there can jump to it and really do amazing work. Um, I loved uh, the analogy from Jacqueline. And I think before I stop, I think that point about gathering data and really curating and loving the data in your data garden so it flourishes, it grows, so that we can then take the crops and take the knowledge from, from that data. And in iAtlantic, we take that enormously seriously. So we take data in very conventional ways from oceanographic research expeditions, from fisheries, data sets, but we also take information from industry and from citizen scientists. One quick example, in Bermuda, there's one individual who's dedicated his life to photographing humpback whales, the tail flukes, and identifying individual whales. Well, by using mark recapture statistical techniques, working with that unique data set, we've suddenly got a new understanding of the migration of those vital uh, whales through Bermuda. Otherwise, this would have been impossible. And I think a really wonderful example of how the smallest data set apparently has huge importance and relevance uh, to our understanding of the health of the Atlantic. So, mm -hmm. so thank you very much. It's a fascinating discussion. Thanks, thanks. Um, Anya, um, can I ask you to, to come in and um, reflect a little? I mean, you're also involved in, in GOOSE, in the Global um, Obs Ocean Observation System. Um, and uh, I would I would ask you um, um, to to reflect on your experiences. Basically, how 
the goose work can with with nations can actually support also sort of a step change in understanding the global um, carbon budget we've in the earlier panel we've just had quite a lively discussion on on the um, distance in many ways still one could say of um, climate science and and ocean science or climate policy making and um, and ocean governance even though of course there have been attempts to bring these two together but maybe you can um, share your experience from um, the perspective within Goose uh, and, and what that also then means for stringing along probably continuous, I would say, always a dialogue processes between science and, and policy making. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for that question. I've really enjoyed listening to the other panelists and um, yes, the Belen Agreement, the scale of the work in iAtlantic, that's super positive, I think, for um, ocean observation. I loved Jacqueline's discussion on Wyomsa. Um, my view is that the Global Ocean Observing System, or GOOSE, is the place to have joined up conversations internationally. And we together can then bring wisdom to what are the next big steps? For example, if you were gonna go from I Atlantic and step up an order of magnitude to bring all nations together, what would that look like? And you know, in my view to date, there have been key gaps in policy understanding about the ocean that have kind of limited the conversation. One of those, and we find it even across the scientific community, is the role of the ocean in the global climate. So over and over again, we find ourselves explaining to policymakers that the ocean is climate. So the ocean has absorbed 90% of the heat that we've produced. The ocean has, has it holds 50 times the carbon that the atmosphere does. And so it's really the trajectory of the ocean carbon budget, which determines the future of our climate. And that simple fact is something that it is often missed by policymakers because they act within national jurisdictions and they enact policies within national boundaries, usually within their EEZ. But the big carbon pulling power of the ocean is the open ocean. And that's beyond national boundaries. And as many of you know, who've been involved in the UN process, those are very BBNJ. Those are very, very tricky places to operate and to create, create policies in. So I think our big challenge as ocean researchers, as scientists, as observers, as humans who love the ocean, is to bring that big picture and the actual scale of what the ocean does in the forefront in our discussions with policymakers. So the, the, the message is, for example, that we, we in the previous panel, I was, I was listening with great interest to Joanna Post's comment, for example, the, and they were talking about the IPCC process, how critical that is in um, bringing information to policymakers. So the IPCC brings to policymakers a kind of a, a mean trajectory. It says very gently over time, the ocean carbon sink will be waning. And so we're going to need to do mitigation and all sorts of other activities, reduce our emissions and mitigate in order to get to keep ourselves under two, two degrees, for example. But what they don't talk about are the uncalibrated risks. And, you know, for example, I Atlantic is looking at the AMOC circulation in the North Atlantic. One of the critical pieces in the, in the, in the whole global ocean is whether or not the Gulf Stream is going to fail. And if that something like that happens at the same time as the Antarctic ice sheet collapse or a, a massive melt in, in the Arctic. So it's these less common or less likely events potentially happening all at once that we, we don't understand those risks very well. In fact, we don't really understand them at all. And they're a, they're a point of actual disagreement within the science community because the risks of uncertain events and then multiplied, uh, multi uh, multiplied risks of those many events happening together is also even harder to, to work on. So what we end up with is we, we stick with this kind of picture of the ocean is slowly declining as a carbon sink, but staying pretty much steady in the future. Whereas scientists who measure the ocean know that the massive ocean changes, for example, that were described in um, chapter nine of the IPCC report will have massive impacts on the carbon, which is not taken into account. So I think if we come back to how do we work 
with policy? How do we get the global policy right? And I think it comes back to something that Jacqueline said, which is visibility. We need to take these simple facts. The ocean absorbs most, in fact, has done almost all all the fossil fuel emissions. 40% of the carbon um, that we've admitted as fossil fuels has ended up in the ocean. The other 60% is pretty much in the atmosphere. That simple fact, again, not really taken into account of by policymakers. So the visibility of that fact should be shifting policymakers to think, okay, how do we solve that problem? How do we reduce that uncertainty? Because right now we're going towards climate targets with this picture of a sort of a gently declining um, carbon sink in the ocean without the real understanding that big changes are happening in circulation and those big changes could be, bring big changes in the carbon budget that are a little bit less likely than the mean. Overall, we have way too few observations to actually resolve them. So our climate modelers don't even bother to ask for what we call a now cast. They don't even ask observers to give them this current state of the ocean. The current state of the ocean takes years to pull together from observations all around the globe. Uh, you know, the, the world ocean assessment, for example, hugely important and yet critically limited by the actual information that we have on an ongoing basis. So coming back to the role of Goose, to me, the role of Goose is to say, we need a step change in how we observe our oceans. We need something akin to an international ocean space station, something that's where nations can step up internationally and co-invest in a structure that allows us to observe the ocean in the way we absolutely need to observe it to have security for our climate goals. And I think this then will put into much better perspective uh, the, you know, it, essentially climate change is this trillion dollar problem. And we have a less than billion dollar answer, which is observe the ocean to reduce its uncertainty. And we know much, we know enough about our climate that we can actually make valid policies. So, as Goose then will need to work with nations to support this step change. And that's not easy, but one of the great things that Goose has, and this is, uh, it's also, it's aligned with the UN decade in that we work with the um, IOC under UNESCO. And that gives us access to the conversation with the parties at COP. It gives us access to conversations with nations. So I think our opportunity then is to have the critical conversations with the ocean observers and bring these key, simple, big messages to policymakers at the Council of Parties so that we can start to get that, that tidal shift in how nations see their ocean observing commitments. And then we get all these wonderful benefits on uh, uh, ancillary benefits, we know more than about the deep ocean, about the deep sea, about biodiversity. So once you start to measure one thing like carbon, you can then hang every other important measurement on that structure. So you can use carbon and for policymakers where climate is so important right now in, in, in the global policy discussion, use that as a hook to get the ocean properly and fully observed. And I'll stop there. Thanks, thanks, Anya. Um, indeed, um, I mean, this is fasc fascinating to listen to all of you, and at the same time, as always, time is ticking, unfortunately, and I would like to still rope us in, into a joint conversation at least um, a little. From many of you, I actually hear, well, and please correct me, we need um, a coordinated, um, decentralized but coordinated approach that puts different knowledge systems into close dialogue with each other, in, into uh, close interaction with each other. Now, Daniel, I would like to, to come back to you. You work with um, data repositories in order to basically move beyond data and, and reflect on, um, on which type of knowledge then um, actually is, is of use. Maybe you can share a little more on this and also link it, of course, potentially to the 3030 goal. Sure. Um, so this is a, a great conversation, and I think there's there's lots of uh, sort of interacting elements here. And 
I think one of the things that's that has been repeated over and over again is the the critical value of of data and not just stand, just data, but standardized data. I mean, one of the things that Goose really offers and all these networks offer is when scientists can get together and begin to come up with standardized methods for collecting the data so that the data can actually speak to each other. Because if you take samples in one location and another location and you and they're only good for understanding what's happening in that particular location, you lose the regional perspective and then you lose the national and the global perspective. So we really need these sort of standardized frameworks. Um, uh, and but I think there's actually a whole nother layer on top of that, if you will, um, and that is that that standardized data is is critical but not sufficient for what we're trying to do because I have I, I ask this question all the time when we, when I stand in front of a conference of parties at a side event or something um, the BBNJ negotiations and I ask how many policymakers have actually opened up one of these repositories and taken some data and done something with it and the answer is of course none no nobody in the room will will raise their hand and that is because there's a missing layer there and that's the sort of knowledge systems rather than the data repository so we need both um, and the knowledge systems that I'm talking about are really this effort, uh, which is really, I think, only largely happened in the last 10 years on the on the biology side, uh, to start to pull together standardized models um, that are really actionable knowledge and can be fed directly into sort of conservation planning uh, or environmental impact assessments that are going on across a huge number of intergovernmental organizations and, and industry. Uh, so in particular, um, the uh, key biodiversity areas, important marine mammal areas, and really the fundamental one that started this movement was uh, uh, important bird and biodiversity areas led by BirdLife International. That effort to create a standardized model uh, for understanding uh, how a particular area meets thresholds and, th and then being able to put that out in a, um, in a single data set that can be integrated seamlessly into processes by the conventional your management organizations is really critical. Thanks, Daniel. Um, now, you say standardized data is critical but not sufficient. And I would like uh, to bring you, Jacqueline, in again and uh, sort of ask, well, I mean, we can think of standards, global standards for data collection, for data analysis that makes it easy in a way to, well, I mean, easy is relative, but easier to bring different data stocks together. But in, in, in a way, you could also say it hom homogenizes um, data and, and reduces the multiplicity, the multitude of perspectives through which we try to get as close to reality as possible. So Jacqueline, can I, can I ask you to reflect on this out of um, your position regarding bringing in also um, different uh, types of knowledges that are maybe not meeting these standardized approaches? You mentioned already local knowledges. Thank you. Um, in response to that, I would say that we need to be flexible. We need to in, uh, integrate flexibility into our work with data, our approaches to data acquisition, and uh, most likely create um, uh, some kinds of uh, standards. Uh, one thing I like is essential ocean variables. And I've seen uh, they make data collection easier because you just have a few sets of variables that you measure with uh, tools that are easy to use. And it, they ensure that the most essential and critical metrics and data sets are collected and not overlooked. So we need to, I would say that we would need to look at uh, what is essential for local knowledge, what is essential for uh, to be able to define uh, the knowledge held uh, through histories of people and to be able to begin to archive it and match it with what we see uh, in the oceans. I mentioned at the start of my conversation that uh, we've been um, in the context of data gathering through the history of our marine institutions in, in this region. And the fact that um, these institutions have been there um, does not mean that all the data has been captured. Um, you know, a lot has been lost simply because of archiving, poor archiving, or it's still uh, documented in lab books. So flexibility to be able to um, 
allow uh, data that may not fit into the confines of what we define as um, proper data sets to be used, because I think there's value in those old records in being able to uh, advise us and being able to guide us understand trends uh, that are historical in nature. Th thanks a lot, uh, Jacqueline. And you mentioned um, essential ocean variables. I know that uh, Karen will um, will have something to say on this. And I would also, Karen, invite you to say a little on um, these regional workshops that you mentioned um, out of the perspective of the question, what do decision makers need? I think that's a question that you also asked. And I would always um, assume, I'm convinced, um, not all decision makers need the same types of knowledges. So can you see a regional pattern emerging or even a pattern with regard to political regimes or economic regimes in place? Thanks. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and certainly um, priorities do um, vary across regions. I think um, Daniel made a good point is that decision makers are, are really interested in what's happening in their own jurisdictions. Um, and Anya made the point is that actually most of the ocean lies outside those jurisdictions. And so there's a tension point between um, meeting the needs of, of policy and decision makers that are really focused on their own jurisdictions while taking the larger picture um, into play to be able to provide that that bigger picture as as Anya was was articulating um, and really drive a conversation um, so that it moves um, to, into that space of, of recognizing um, the ocean and the key role that the ocean plays um, for human life uh, on this planet um, so um, Linking back to the essential ocean variables, and, and Daniel gave a really good example um, of how we're trying to integrate multiple variables, um, the collection of, of multiple variables to really provide that bigger context on what's happening in the ocean. So Daniel was talking about a, a program called Anabos, uh, which is putting um, sensors on, on animals um, to not only understand where those animals are moving, but at the same time, um, they're collecting a suite of environmental variables that put those movements into context and really provide information on why animals are going where they're going and what is driving change in their movements through time um, and part of what um, we're trying to do within um, the global ocean observing system is finding ways in in which uh, we can set some um, some common best practices and some standard operating procedures and Jacqueline um, touched on this so that we can actually bring data sets together to be able to integrate them, to be able to provide that bigger picture um, so that um, through mechanisms uh, like the World Ocean Assessment, we can then take those observations, translate them into knowledge that decision makers can use, but importantly, provide that bigger global perspective to be able to drive decision makers collectively um, towards uh, better decision making and more sustainable decision making. Mm. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and I would like to bring in a comment uh, from from the chat and and sort of pass it over to you, Mari. Um, it's a comment that focus uh, that asks whether talking about data is sometimes a bit too cold, a bit too sort of distanced in order to get um, people involved and and basically tickle their empathy, empath empathic relationship with the ocean. And I understand that you you emphasize in in your in your also. Um, assessment or reflections with regard to the I Atlantic project that you put different data stocks and types into close dialogue with each other and um, um, pay pay attention actually to to basically also a form of co-creation if I understood you correctly. Um, what kind of role do do um, 
do yeah, effective or perception-based uh, data play in the I Atlantic project? And what what role do you foresee for for this type of um, one could say maybe emotionalizing um, ocean relationships um, in order to, to support policy advisory processes? Uh, thank you. Well, I think one thing that we're very, very focused on um, at, at the heart of our project, we're about life in the ocean. We, we, we care passionately and want to understand what lives where, why it lives where it lives, and if it, we stress it, what it's going, what's going to happen to that life. Now, that might be fish that are important commercially uh, to local communities or to the international trade in, in, um, in fishery products. Um, it might be culturally relevant um, structural habitats of the, of the deep ocean, which when people understand, in, in fact, some earlier work we looked at in the Northeast Atlantic, in fact, across the whole North Atlantic, we found that people valued the presence and the bequest value to their children and grandchildren extremely highly over and above short-term economic gains. Th these were findings that the scientists involved and the researchers involved in, in the projects found rather startling. That uh, you know, th th These were independent as assessments of the wider public. These were not friends of scientists, children of scientists. They had absolutely no immediate connection to the deep sea um, ecosystems about which they were, they were being asked to uh, reflect upon, but they cared deeply that they were there. They found that uh, that value was incredibly important. So I Atlantic, actually talking to Daniel's point, we challenge ourselves quite a lot by taking very diverse information. It's a nightmare, to be honest with you, because it isn't standardized. But we're trying the best we can to work with what there is. Sometimes we look at data sets or compilations of data sets in the ocean and we think, what a lot of information there is, because we see screeds of data, but that might be from one tiny place measured intensely, like the mooring arrays uh, that the physical oceanographers have in place, or the Argo float systems that look extraordinary. You see these thousands of floats across the ocean, but they're measuring a massive part of our planet. Uh, the data paucity is really, really stark. So I Atlantic tries to bring in very diverse uh, ecosystem time series and then use the same analytical approaches. That's, that's the key thing for us is we unify the analysis and we have to then constrain what we can say, but we can do this in a very robust way. And that's what we're working on right now. That's where the coal face is for our project, is understanding whether the ecosystems are showing significant signs of stress. And if they are, and those ecosystems are occurring in places in the Atlantic that are themselves experiencing rapid climate driven changes, well, those are the special places we need to manage particularly carefully. So that's one of the big kind of outputs from the approach that we're taking that we're particularly excited about. So I think people do feel a genuine affinity for life. They feel a real affinity uh, for the importance the ocean has in sustaining uh, the natural world. And they do value that. So in fact, this then talks immediately to the importance of getting the word out there, getting outside, you know, academic research, getting outside peer-reviewed publications and talking directly to children. Uh, so children will bother their parents about it and the parents will bother the politicians about it. I can't really personally overemphasize the importance of that. It's also tremendous fun. People love the ocean and they want to care about it. Mm. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I've heard from a number of you stating, well, um, we, we don't only bring data together, excuse my lay terms here, but we also identify gaps and basically it's a strategic exercise in order to understand, well, where are future risks, where are p potential cumulative effects, where do we need, where, where do we have simple gaps, where, where do we need to dig deeper or, um, or assure um, also the filling of, of um, gaps in a time series, for instance. Um, how, I mean, what, and I, and I had the feeling that most of you were um, mainly here addressing actually global level exercises, so to say. At the same time, if you look at the, the, the global um, science system, there is actually substantial fragmentation and we, we know that, um, that representation of different uh, also science systems, not even going as far as knowledge systems in general, um, are substantially underrepresented. So can I ask you, 
um, to take this as sort of a last round quick reflection on how would you practically change this, you could say, inequity in knowing the ocean um, by, by assuring the further development of our structures that are in place in order to bring uh, data and, and analyses together. And I would just go around the table, which is a virtual table, and, and ask you to each sort of take a minute, not more, because time is unfortunately coming to an end. And you're welcome to, of course, also link it to maybe a final statement that you might want to bring in. Um, so can I hand over, maybe we start with you, Anja, and go from the other way around this time? Sure. Thank you very much, and a great question. I do believe that the linking together of international systems, having nations come together as they do for ocean, an ocean space station, for the telescopes, for other really big international organizations is what is the direction we need to go. But I think what we've also heard today and something that we're trying to do at the Ocean Frontier Institute is work with our local communities as well. So we need something that crosses scales and that's much harder. So today when I leave you, I will be going into a room full of project facilitators who've come to us from the Nanatsiviet province of Labrador up, up north and who are co-designing um, four to six years worth of ocean research by choosing their village and their community's priorities um, to share with us. And so we w wait for them to lead us. And that's the, that's the new uh, exciting frontier um, and something that is gonna be a big challenge going forward, but a joyful one. Thanks. Thanks, Anya. And Murray, do you want to take it away? Thank you. You know, a, a great a great way to conclude conclude our discussions. So I, I, I very much enjoyed Anya your uh, your major points and your reference and analogy to a space station. I think that's a very very helpful way to think about things and to take this discussion further. Uh, so we need to organise that, that the discussion we had about funding. Sometimes it's so prosaic. But unless we organize it and get those people that hold the purse strings to unify the opportunities, it's not going to happen. And then the single most important thing we invest in is people. The projects that I run, the projects like, like iAtlantic, we always put most of the budget to people. We need to train people and we need to share expertise. So I would always advocate for that, the, the single most important thing. Thank mm. you. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mari. Jacqueline. Thank you. I've really enjoyed the conversation today and learned a great deal. Um, when we look at our history of research, uh, it doesn't match our history of publications uh, in Africa. It, it, taking a glance at the Global Ocean Science Report, Africa appears as a dot in terms of publications, but there is a wealth of information. And for me, that is the biggest gap. How do I move what is lying in the desks as great literature data, data in desks that um, needs to get out so that the history can be mapped out, the changes can be mapped out. And I liked what Murray said, that a really small piece of data can make an impact. A really small uh, uh, piece of information can change the way we think, uh, can help us understand what was happening in the past and how to deal with the future. So I think for us, the gap is, um, how do we make it attractive to get our data sets out there? And I believe it's a dialogue we can continue to have with Goose um, to make sure that scientists feel the rewarding impact of doing uh, that. Hmm. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, Karen, over to you. I think it's in the middle of the night at your end. Please, thanks for, for, for even staying up. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I just would like to um, just reiterate what people have said. Um, you know, quite often um, collection of ob observations goes on at a local level. Um, it's funded either locally or, or nationally. And so it's really important to be able to um, bring those, those uh, various communities together. And, and that's what the global ocean observing system is trying to do is to bring to provide that platform that brings communities together um, but I think Jacqueline makes a, a really important point you, you know it, it's not just um, perhaps particular parts of the, the world that that have historical data that 
that is incredibly useful. Um, most organisations are sitting on historical data that's still sitting in filing cabinets. And so there's a wealth of, of, of information um, that, uh, that is sitting there. So it's not just about what observations do we need to collect moving forward, but how do we actually um, take that wealth of information that's been collected historically, um, not only by scientists, but as Jacqueline mentioned, by local communities. Um, those local communities have been observing the ocean um, in some parts of the world for, for thousands of years. Um, and so there's a, there's a wealth of information there. And so how do, we, how do we bring those communities together from the local right through to the global? Um, and how do we pl provide that platform, as Jacqueline was saying, to really um, enhance the, the visibility of, of that information? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, Daniel, over to you, but maybe I can sneak in a last question from the chat if, if you allow me to. Mm. And this focuses on how do we bring in people that live far away from the coast? Sure. Um, I, I think this actually fits uh, because when the, the original question was focused on underrepresented areas uh, in sampling or in the scientific community. And I think one of the things that's really obvious from a system like the, the one that, that I lead, the Migratory Connectivity Ocean System, which is the entire purpose is to sort of identify and describe, visualize connectivity that is generated by migratory species. And that connectivity doesn't stop at, uh, the, the, um, at a beach. It doesn't stop at a border. It goes across all of those things. Uh, we can pretty much, you give me a place in the world and we can connect it to probably any other place in the world by movement of animals across those, those areas. Uh, and so the take home message that I want to bring from this is actually gets back to Anya's gap as well, that, that, all actions are local, but unless we're acting together, uh, we are not going to solve these problems. The movement of these migratory species, these sort of ocean wanderers, they, they don't know any boundaries. They travel seamlessly from pole to, to, to the tropics or from poles to poles or from ocean basin to ocean basin. Uh, so they, you know, they're, they're connecting the entire globe and they connect the welfare of the planet on a, on a just a vast scale. So the simple lesson for, for me here is that it's all links in a chain and we are only as strong as the weakest links in those chains. And I don't mean weak, I mean the, the most undersampled, most underrepresented part of our scientific community. So it's really critical that we, we act together, that we manage together, and that we govern together, because these issues are not just for migratory species, but um, Anya's repeated reference to climate crisis and how we're managing the climate crisis. They don't affect one particular place. And what you do in one particular place doesn't just affect your migratory species population or the climate in that particular area. We have to do this at a planetary scale uh, together if you're going to move this forward. And that requires building everybody up to create that sustainable transformation that we're looking yeah. for. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, and we have to unfortunately come to an end. I would like to share my uh, key um, takeaway points with you that we will also carry into the session uh, on Thursday. First of all, I hear from all of you um, a strong plea for, on the one side, diversity of knowledge types of knowledge, knowledge systems, but assuring that they stand in close dialogue with each other, that they um, stand in um, a coordinated, in a constructive dialogue with each other. I also hear um, a strong um, plea for assuring concerted efforts as part of this in order to then bridge the divide and, and interact in, in continuous processes with policy making um, and, and reflect on the funding structure structures reflect on how funding structures and incentive systems, Jacqueline, you mentioned them several times, um, assure or come with biases, one could maybe say, but assure already particular framings and give us a chance uh, to um, overcome these by, again, bringing um, different types of, of um, knowledge generating processes into close dialogue with each other. So I hear also here the emphasis maybe as a, as a third part um, that these global exercises of bringing, getting us closer towards knowing the ocean are built on transregional partnerships, on trust, on 
mutual respect. That's what I also took away from our conversation here today. I really would like to thank all of you for joining um, and hope that we can now um, move into a wrap up for today, but only for today and then take it further in the coming two days. Thank you. And I hand over to Monica. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm already, I'm, I'm al already here. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Anna Katrina. And of course, uh, a big thank you to this great panel. There was a takeaway that I have uh, actually also, in addition to those, especially this last comment uh, about how to include uh, that part of the world's population nowhere near a coast. That is, I thought, continuity, because that was a question that we thoroughly addressed in the first Ocean Decade Laboratory, an inspiring and engaging ocean, and it just shows you continuity throughout the Ocean Decade. Those points are picked up again and again, and that is fantastic. And I think what uh, today's core event certainly showed, yes, I mean, science plays a big role, but I think you now also understand why we need to have this third panel discussion in order to bring together what has been addressed, in particular the question how we can get the right architecture in place uh, in order to bring the relevant data, the relevant science to policy makers. Because otherwise it's nice talking amongst each other, uh, but there are people who have to make decisions and they need to listen, they need to understand and we must help them. That already brings us to the end of this core event. And I have to say, I mean, you were the key players. Obviously, you were running the show, <laughs> Anna, Katrina, and, and Sebastian. Uh, happy so far uh, and, and uh, rolling up our sleeves for, for Thursday? Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, Monica, I'm not sure if we can really roll up our sleeves, um, but I think it has been really um, great and, um, and exciting to see how sort of well aligned these two panel discussions actually have, have been. Sort of the policymakers really clearly identified um, the key issues from their perspective. And I think what was so visible here is that also the science is already responding and really, you know, uh, grasping the challenge. Also, how to communicate to policymakers. So this is really um, inspiring, I think. And, um, and what is also really interesting is what's coming up on the screen now, and that's the result of our um, poll. And, and you have voted on these um, three possible answers to our question, to this overarching question for our um, whole um, laboratory. And um, there is a slight um, majority that really believe that we need a new ocean science policy interface with 54%. Actually, no one thinks that we can just um, remain or keep the status quo. But there's also quite a strong group that believes, yes, let's look what we have. Perhaps we can strengthen and build on existing structures. The interesting bit is we will pose this question again on Thursday. And we want to see if something has changed over the course of our um, laboratory. Let me now perhaps very brie briefly summarize a few um, key messages that, that um, we um, take home from, from our side event. Of course, we cannot reflect everything, but for me, very clear, and that was also the statement in the last session, is that we need a step change uh, in the way how we bring together science, how we communicate science to policy making. This is really so obvious after this discussion. And we need um, three sort of main areas where we have to, um, where we need to get strong. And this is um, the point that Monica, you mentioned, that's the continuity that's needed, that is stable funding, it's um, frameworks and dialogue uh, systems, and we need um, to have processes that create trust between science, policy making, and those people that are affected by those decisions on the ground. We need to be better in integrating different types of knowledge and different um, governance systems, and we need to create the collaborative frameworks, both at the regional and at the global level. Okay. Anna Katharina. 
No, I think um, you, you summarize the main points. Maybe I just add the emphasis on um, capacity development, workforce um, development. I think that was uh, also part of the last panel. I think it's an important one, often, often downplayed a little. Um, but if you want to foster these continuous, and we need actually to foster these continuous dialogues um, f between science and policy making, we need um, mutual respect, yes, but we also need mutual interest interest in interacting with each other and interacting as epistemic friends, one could say, with each other over a long period of time and with a joint aim in mind. And I think that requires um, um, yeah, the conscious also um, learning, basically, um, on, on both sides um, and beyond. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And of course, uh, you can take a breather just uh, very briefly, because now everybody out there is going to get very busy. The satellite activities are coming up. As I mentioned, 22, the one will only start after the wrap up. That is when uh, we will all see each other again, hopefully. Uh, but in the meantime, what you can do is you can continue to browse through our uh, Ocean uh, Decade Library. You can uh, review previous uh, laps uh, through the lounge button, maybe to find out uh, some of the key messages uh, and key takeaways that have been discussed previously and see the continuity there. Or you can uh, just network, chat with other participants using our chat box. All of that is possible because the conference platform will be up and running throughout this entire Ocean Decade Laboratory. As I mentioned, satellite activities are starting in different parts of the world and in different time zones. And we'll meet again on Thursday, again in the afternoon, starting at 2.30 p.m. Central European time with our, I would say, this time very special wrap up of this laboratory. So have fun, be constructive, and I look forward to seeing you all again on Thursday.